Well, um, welcome everybody. Um, I have to say that uh, we are going to skip all these pieces of two doors on the back, two doors on the front, and that sort of thing, so, because you all know the place. But what I cannot skip is the reason why we are all here. Okay? Um, some people say that the AA is different. It certainly is. So when we come to um, elect a new director, um, we have a search uh, committee, and uh, we have the whole school, and we have council. The search committee searches, uh, the school community elects, and council appoints. So the reason for this uh, is, that, is the other th aspect that the AA is also special. And that's the ability to turn a situation into something that we can actually enjoy and learn something from it. So we had a difficulty, and that with the pandemic, there were a large proportion of the voting uh, cohorts that uh, had not been in the AA and didn't, physically and didn't know much about how we went about things in the AA. So we started doing all sorts of um, programs of um, workshops and all that. And then it was decided that we were going to have a day like today, an event like today so that we could all go and vote uh, meaningfully, right? knowing what we were doing. Now, but the other aspect is that this is an opportunity, so turning a need into an opportunity to think about what it is that teaching architecture is all about. And we need this sort of thing every so often. Now, the reaction has been fantastic. I mean, everyone that we asked to, to come and talk, whether it's keynote speakers or in the panels and so on, has been overwhelming. Everybody said yes straight away, and there's an awful lot of very, very interesting things happening today that um, Takako and, and Angel will explain. But I want to thank a lot of people, because uh, it's a long list, but, uh, and I, I think I'm going to miss quite a few. But obviously, Takako and Angel from the search committee have done an awful lot of work. Uh, Anna, behind the scenes, has been doing, again, putting things together. But then we cannot forget uh, the AV uh, team that um, make it all happen, the public program, and uh, we know how hard they work. And then the communication studio that is actually irons out all the problems that there'll be. So I just wanted to welcome you all and to thank those who've been working behind the scenes, but particularly the speakers have been so, so wonderful. You know, all of them have been uh, re returning the emails on the day. Yeah. Okay, Angel Takako. Um, right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we're gonna go through a little bit of the housekeeping and how everything is gonna run through the day. Uh, welcome everyone, we're very excited to have you all here uh, on site or online uh, for an interesting day of, uh, of discussions. So um, just looking through the, through the schedule, we're going to start uh, with our keynote uh, lecture, which Takako will introduce in a bit. We're going to move to our roundtable discussion for the morning based on the creative uh, process. Uh, and in the afternoon we have an exciting panel as well for the educational models, and another keynote um, a lecture by uh, Doshi. Uh, this will be followed by a breakout sessions where we will all join together in smaller groups to discuss the findings of the event and to ponder on what the future of uh, education is. And now I'd like to hand over to Takako to introduce our keynote speaker for the morning. Excuse me. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the symposium. We are so excited that we made it here. And um, I just want to, sorry, I'm Takako from such committee as a student representative. So the first keynote speaker is Marina Tabasam. Um, uh, she's a Bangladesh architect and educator who founded Dhaka-based Marina Tabasam Architects in 2005. In her work, Tabasam seeks to establish a language of architecture that is complementary, uh, sorry, contemporary, yet reflectively rooted to place always against an, an ecological rubric containing climate, 
context, culture, and history. Tabasom has taught in Harvard University Graduate School of Design, Technical University Delft, University of Texas, and Bangor Institute. In addition to Aga Khan Awards for Architecture, she has received many accolades, including Arnold W. Brunner Memorial Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, Gold Medal of the French Academy of Architecture, and Somme Medal in Architecture from the UK in 2021. So I will hand over to Marina, uh, now uh, titled Rethinking Creativity. Thank you, Marina. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I am in Dhaka, Bangladesh. So basically, um, I will be talking from here. So greetings to everybody who has joined in. Um, I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, today um, I wanted to basically uh, focus on some of the projects that are um, currently we are doing, which is very much concerning the climate issues. Um, uh, we are, as we know, going through a time, which is a sort of a reality check. Um, on one hand, we have the climate crisis. On the other hand, we have the uh, crisis of our um, health, and both are pressing, quite confusing also. Um, we're all searching for ways of um, finding a balance um, where our existence is in crisis. So basically, uh, that's where we are. And how did we get here? So, you know, many times that's what I've been thinking for the last two to three years now, that what made us come to this position. And basically um, it's the growth fetish in a way, the production of things that is constantly, you know, we have this idea of exponential growth and this cannot go on for hundreds of years. So the tra trajectory of human consumption uh, needs to change and it needs to change radically uh, so that we can make some effort. And so basically it's this idea of, extraction, over extract, extraction and over um, production in many ways. And of course, this enormous disparity or the ill distribution of uh, wealth that we see around us. Um, so basically these are issues that are concerning us. And at the same time, we see the global um, trade and the supply chains where we can see that the entire world is absolutely one single entity where something, a consumer item, which is being produced in China ends up in, in the uh, Great Pacific um, uh, areas where you see that the birds are eating these plas plastics. So at one point, this what is predicted by 2050, our oceans will have more plastic than fish. So is that the reality? That's the reality, but is that what we want? So according to research and, and, and you know, as you can see that uh, the co building and construction industry also uh, um, contributes enormously. 50% of the climate change uh, that, that are factors of climate change are, um, are by our building and construction industries. So definitely we have uh, we have enormous responsibility towards it. This idea of standardization of construction globally uh, popularized the idea of concrete to optimize speed and scale. And we can see that concrete has become the second most consumed item. It's after water. So we consume more concrete than we consume food. That's the reality. Portland cement actually accounts to 8% of global CO2 emission. Our stockpile of, uh, of steel is 25 gigatons. That's the man-made stockpile that we have. That's three tons per person. And these are really issues that are there. Now, I am confused as everyone else, what to do about this, where to go, where is the direction? There probably is not one single direction, but many, many directions. 
and every direction has to be an answer to that very location. So context plays a key role. Time plays a key role. So that's where I am. And so, I, as I said, I do not really have any answer. I'm just basically trying uh, to address the issues that are concerning me and my location. It's a practice based in Dhaka. Um, and um, as you know, Bangladesh is facing an enormous challenge. And so basically what we are thinking is that the focus needs to shift. The focus needs to shift from man to nature, to environment. And that's when I say that we need to rethink and reevaluate and revisit what we have done and reconnect with uh, what was uh, our old wisdom and to find our ways through that. So basically, that's why I say that we need to rethink the creativity altogether. So there are certain things that I wrote, and I'd probably just like to uh, read it out. In the name of economic growth, we have extracted far more than the earth had time to renew and repair. In the exponential growth of the economy, the ecosystem was ignored as a major part of the equation. Over the past several decades, global consumption of waste have grown at an unprecedented rate. This has not only left the earth with depleting resources and polluted environment, but also threatens the natural habitat of human and other species. We must realize the vulnerability of our existence. The natural world needs time to repair and renew to ensure habitability of our future generations. Time calls for healing the earth. Time calls for responsible construction practices that ensures local industries to flourish at the same time manage waste to assure environmental balance. We also need to think about the materials that we use, the anthropo anthropogenic metabolism and natural sinks. The amount of material under waste management are increasing globally due to rising level of consumption. Much of our long living livestock materials inherited by waste management are from construction industry that needs to be renewed. It is high time that alternative materials are con uh, for construction are sought and explored by architects that reduces extraction from earth and encourages the use of growing stock. Waste management systematically closes the anthropogenic cycle of material, giving them back to the earth's crust in a controlled and environmentally sustainable manner. And then multidisciplinary collaborative research and practices are also important. For a very long time, architects catered to the market demand, limiting their potential to buildings only. Whereas our capacity to envision the healthier, equitable living environment must reach beyond the visual realm as a genuine concern for the environment. Multidisciplinary collaborative research and practices are imperative for a future that is full of challenges as exploration into climate positive alternative materials will require knowledge sharing to seek out time appropriate solutions. So those are certain concerns and the way I think we should go forward in many ways. Bangladesh, as I said, where I am based um, is again, one of the major countries or which, we, which is being threatened by the climate crisis where the sea level is rising. And by 2050, we are predicting one meter sea level rise and which will inundate uh, one third of Bangladesh's southern part. Now to go back to, to some extent, the practice where we are, um, this is Bangladesh and two third of Bangladeshi land is actually progradation of the Ganges estuary, which is in the southern part of Bangladesh here. And you see uh, it's more a waterscape than a landscape. The entire land of this two third Delta, which is the largest delta in the world, the Ganges Delta, was formed by two major rivers, the Brahmaputra and the uh, Ganges. And so these two rivers converged into the Bay of Bengal and while doing so accumulating silt and the silt has created this land, which is the Delta. And the uniqueness of the Ganges Delta is that it moves. It, it has a dynamic system 
and the river is constantly reshaping and rechanging its uh, shapes and courses. And while doing so, it erodes the banks. And on the other side, it also creates new sand beds and sediments. Now in a very close up, if you look at it, basically it, when the erosion happens, it happens during the monsoon season, which is um, as half, of, half of the year when we have rain and it's the summer months also. That's when the glacial flow from the Himalayas come down to the Bay of Bengal. And the current is so heavy that it basically um, washes away. And it has washed away many of the villages, small towns, um, and many, many houses and families have lost their life and livelihood. Many people have become landless, moving away from their own location to becoming climate migrants and moving to different locations. And so that's a reality, reality of Bangladesh. And as architects, do we have responsibility towards that? That's a question that we all need to think about. And on the other side, when there is dry season, uh, new sand beds come up in the middle of the river. And these sand beds are not really land. They belong to the river because they washes away at times and depends, depending on how long uh, the land would remain. At times it stays for a year, at times for eight years, maybe 20, 30 years. At times it becomes mature and remains as a land. But there is no guarantee of it, of being a land. So these sand beds are also, again, another reality of the Ganges movement. And so if you go very closely, um, we've done some research on the southern part, which is the lower Meghna River right here, as you see these dots. Uh, we, we've uh, tried to trace different families, how they have moved uh, throughout their lifespan. And you can find that their people have moved uh, within one lifetime, three to four times, moving from one location to another. And when they move, the entire village moves. So basically it's the village, um, uh, the people of the village with the, with the bazaar and all the establishments, they move from one location to another location. And that's a constant movement, which is absolute reality of the people living in the coastal areas of Bangladesh. And what you see is that there is this interesting vernacular form uh, of building, which is a flat back system, which has, which, has, which has actually been there for more than 200 years, where it's a wooden frame structure and um, basically knockdown down system. So whenever there is a, um, when, they do it, when they feel that the land will be, washed away, they basically take it down and they move to a different location. Uh, so it's a, it's a flat pack system, constantly moving. And in the markets, in many parts in Bangladesh around this area, in the Ganges and the Brahmaputra River, you'll find markets where you can actually buy these flat pack houses. Um, and you, you, you can buy and then basically it's an absolute interesting system. So for our Sharjah Triennial, where we were commissioned to do uh, research on these coastal areas, we bought three of these houses uh, from the market. And we took it to Sharjah, UAE, where we remade uh, or reassembled these houses and placed it in the location. So in the Sharjah Triennial, we were given a courtyard um, in the middle of the, this uh, venue, which is an abandoned school, uh, which was turned into the venue. And in the courtyard, we basically placed the house. And when we were doing this project, where we actually bought the houses, shipped it to Sharjah from Dhaka, um, and, um, and three of the architects from my office and a carpenter went there to rebuild or, or, or you know, bring it up, basically to reconstruct these houses. Um, it came a, to a quite an interesting point where we architects became builders. And I thought that's a, that's, that was probably for the first time that we started doing that, where architects took hands-on 
uh, responsibility of bringing materials together and start to build. And interestingly, it was quite an interest, quite a moment for us because um, we became part of this process of building. And, um, and so as you see here, we, we took three houses. Uh, one was this two-story house and there were two other single-story houses. And our research was more about the rights of future generation in these precarious landscape, uh, which we traced and every um, aspect of our research was then displayed within these houses. So a house of this nature, um, if, if you want to buy in the market, it costs about 3,000 to 4,000 pounds. But uh, for a landless person who is living in, the, in these sand beds, do not have that much money or the luxury of buying a house, which is 3,000 to 4,000 pounds. And so what they, so during uh, the COVID time in 2020, when office was closed, um, we were working from home. We decided that we should pro proceed with this idea of um, flat back system house and try to come up with an idea which is lightweight, uh, smaller in scale, uh, which can be easily dismantled and brought together and something which costs much less. So what we did is uh, we created a structure which is made out of bamboo and steel joints um, it's, we started with a, a three meter by three meter, and then this could be enlarged to up to four meter by four meter modules. So it's basically a space frame structure that is connected with steel joints. And, and this is, uh, at the moment, we can build this structure for 300 pounds. And so this was a structure which we thought that could be something that can help the people who has no land but lives in these sand beds uh, in, inside the rivers, wherever there's a new sand bed coming up, people go and move there because they don't have any land to live in. So uh, if we could give it to them, they could create this community and whenever they need to move, they could move. Or, you know, since this, ha this has two levels, um, during the flooding season, they could move to the upper deck uh, while the lower, lower deck uh, is underwater. This is a structure that can also be taken wherever they are going, even moving to the city, which then can have a place for them to have a little shop underneath and living on the upper deck. So basically, this was the idea that we generated. So even within that lockdown time in 2020, we started building this. So as I said, that my architects now are very hands-on. They know how to build so basically they're the ones, two of the architects, they built it with bamboo and steel joints and created this first uh, modular structure uh, that we kind of tried out to see uh, if this really works. So it's all made out of bamboo with a tin, tin corrugated sheet on top. Um, and then once we were confident that this is a possibility that we can take to the, to the people in the, living in the sand beds, which in Bangla we call chore. So if we can take it to the people and see if they accept it as a viable solution for their houses. So this is where we went, actually. It's in the middle of the Meghna River, which is right before going into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, this is a regular makeshift boat that takes you from Dhaka to that area, one of the chores, larger chores, which is Chor Bhairobi. And then from there, you have to take a smaller boat to go to the middle of the river where the sand beds are located. So this is one of the sand beds, as you see. And that on the horizon, you see the main river. The river is such an enormous size that you cannot see the other side of it. And, and this here is just two chores or two, two sand beds. And, and in between is just a part of the river's water. So this entire area is actually part of the river. And this is where we went, uh, taking, um, connecting with the local uh, people who are living on that chore. So basically what they do is they have their makeshift houses, uh, small in scale, and then all, all around that area, they basically do the farming um, as long as this sand bed remains. When the sand bed then washes away, they move to another sand bed. So they move from one sand bed to another sand bed. Basically that's how they live. So this was the first house that we built. This is a single module house. Um, 
The idea is that we will build the structure and we'll do the roof and all the facades in the lower level uh, will be done by the, by the owners themselves. And this is the house, as you see here, and that's the toilet and a, a toilet facility that we also created for them. Uh, so this is the old house, and that's the new one that we uh, made for them. Later on, they took this facades, what you see here, made out of grass, tall grass, uh, woven tall grass. So basically, they take that and make a house uh, or the facade around it. So that's one of our team members. Uh, and uh, so as I was mentioning that this is all tall grass woven into facades. This is the only material that's available in the chore. Otherwise, you would have to take everything. So transportation is quite difficult. So we just took the bamboos and the steel joints with us. Uh, the rest was all sourced from uh, the chore and the location. This is another house, which is a two module house, as you see here. Uh, this is a bigger family, so they needed a two module, a lar larger house. Uh, so this is, again, the two modules, and then the stair goes in the middle to go to the upper deck. Um, what they did is they took the facades from the older house and rebuilt the facade on the, on the ground floor so that the house is complete. Um, the lower level is mostly for the daily activity and uh, the upper deck is where they actually sleep at night. And it's interesting that the children in that chore area, they never had the viewpoint of going above a certain level. So it's always nice for them to enjoy the view. So basically um, the team, as I said, it's, it's the architects who actually go there and build. So nowadays um, in our office, when we are searching for architects, uh, we are really looking into portfolios anymore. Um, uh, you know, portfolios in the sense that what kind of formal expressions they are capable of doing or what kind of renderings and softwares do they know. It's about how well they are, they are able to build hands-on. So that's one of the major things, whether they're able to go to a location where there is no running water, no electricity, and we'll be giving them a tent to live in They'll have to make their own toilet and go to the site and start building. And so all these architects that you see in these images are, you know, are them. Uh, so the entire project was built by architects and the locals who are living in that chore area. Um, and the children, they don't go to school. They don't have a school in the chore. So basically, uh, we try to give them books and anything that's possible whenever we have a possibility to do so. So this was one of the projects that we did. Again, another area, which is, as you see here in the satellite image, that it's all water everywhere. It's just water on all sides. So the villages are like long linear lines. It's just along the line. Uh, um, there is the road that connects from one end to the other. And basically along the road, the houses are just built like row houses one after another. And people in these areas are, uh, are one of the ultra low income people, as you can see. Um, so again, when we go there, we do a workshop. Uh, this is a, a very, I would say very, uh, it's an intervention uh, into the landscape or into people's life, but every decision comes from people. So when we go there, the first act is to start mapping. So here is in this image, you see that the architect is basically sitting with children and the women of the village, and they try to create a map of the entire village. And if you see the map here, you see that it's a long line of houses, that's the road, and on both sides of the road are water. And so once they have made this map, then everybody knows where their houses are. And then it's easier for us to then decide, or not for us to decide, but for the community to decide whom they would like to give the house. And then we also have this idea of making models with children and also with the community to give them an idea of what this structure is about, how it connects and everything. And so we built one house and, these, um, and, the, and the people are actually, the community 
decides who we will, we will build a house for. So this is a family of three children and a husband and wife. They have no income. Um, 300 taka, that would be three cents per day. That's the income that he has. Uh, so the, and the village kind of pitched in a little bit of fund and with our own funding, we basically built a house. So that's the family, that's the children. That's one of the architects who was on site. Um, and, and these architects are so dedicated. Uh, we call them community architects. So basically they are engaged, engaging with the community and working with them. And the, and the owners of the houses also work. As you can see here, they're putting the mud on the floor. So it's a mud, mud plinth on which the house is placed and the upper level is already made. So, and, and whatever little materials that they had, all, and, and the entire area is actually made out of corrugated sheet um, houses. So we just salvaged some corrugated sheet from their house and built the lower deck for the lower level facades and everything. So you see here, everybody's happy that this family who had nowhere to live now has a small house uh, where they can uh, live. So it's a process that we have developed and this process has kind of gone on and, and now we have worked in many different areas. This is um, in, near the Rohingya refugee camps. Uh, we are working with the World Food Program in the Rohingya refugee camps. Uh, so before we started our work in the camps, we needed a place to stay near the camp. And the camp is actually in a location which used to be a forest land. So there is hardly any place to live. The closest city is Cox's Bazaar, which is about one and a half hours drive. And so we didn't want to live in, this, in the city. We wanted to live close to the camp where our site was. So for that reason, we started by building a house for ourselves. And we thought since we have this mechanism of building uh, the modular house, why don't we make one for ourselves? And so we started with a construction workshop where we brought in the workers who uh, are local people. So they came and they learned about the system, how the, how the structure actually joins and the bamboos are connected. And we also, when we do the workshop, we also try to engage them to understand how they live, what's their uh, technique of building and everything so that there is a knowledge sharing, a horizontal knowledge sharing that happens. So here you see on site, the structure is up. And in the lower level, you see the building that we built. And when we do the workshops, what we do is we also give them uh, some interesting materials like papers to draw, uh, all the drawing tools and equipments, um, model making equipment, some measuring tapes uh, in a nice colorful bag. And they're very happy to have that. And at the end of the workshop, we also have a certificate so that they know, everybody knows that they also know how to make this modular mobile house system. So it's a certified system. So this is the first house that we built, um, uh, which is actually our own living space. So we live here when we go to the site. So the architects go, they live there. We have a toilet and we have four rooms um, and, a, and a small space in the middle. Um, the upper level is for sleeping. The lo lower levels are where we do our work on a daily basis. Um, as you see here, um, we have guests also at times, architects who are working in the camps and different with different uh, development agencies also come over at times. So we have nice time. Um, so that's the upper deck where we have our beds and everything. So it's the same structure that you see we give to the uh, people in the tour areas who are the ultra low income people in Bangladesh. And we took the same idea and built our own house, which is made out of, of course, uh, a better material because um, this is not something we will be moving in a short time. So this will stay there for a while, as long as uh, our work continues in the camps. Uh, so that's the team uh, of our architects and engineers and carpenters who are on site uh, working in the, in the camps. So to go back to the projects that we are doing in the Rohingya refugee camp, uh, in 2002 and 15, as you can see here, this is a forest land, um, which used to be um, a place known for elephants. 
And um, during the exodus of 2017, the ethnic cleansing of the Myanmar Rohingyas, um, and as they came in, all these land were sort of, all the trees were cut down and people were made, uh, these places were turned into makeshift um, habitats or shelters for people to live. And uh, if you look at it here, you see that all the forest land was cut and roads were built. Uh, the sides, as you see here, are sort of trying, they're trying to protect this, uh, the embankments or the slope stabilizing um, and to make it uh, uh, at least a habitable place uh, for 1 million people. And now uh, with all these 1 million people being on site and no plantation or no plants, the microclimate is changing. Uh, there is an enormous amount of landslide that happens. Um, and so we were, when we started work uh, or one of our first work was to uh, to replant or reforest these areas and also to stabilize the slope. And, and so we tried out many different techniques. One technique was uh, bamboo nailing. So we took bamboos and we nailed it um, into the ground. And um, the idea was that live bamboo, when you nail it, then it will start to grow and it will uh, slowly stabilize the earth and the, and the soil. And it also started the same way as you see here, the refugees, uh, we had, um, workshop with the refugees learning about, because it's important for, for us to bring them into conversation and to get them involved into the whole process so that um, they are the ones who will be protecting these uh, lands of uh, forest areas. The other technique that we used was the mud ball technique where we took seeds and we made balls and wherever one cannot go or physically not possible to go, you just throw the mud balls or the seed balls, and um, the seed will start to grow during the monsoon season. So that's, again, one of the techniques that we used. The other technique was to go close to the forest areas where the forest is still there. So you see here, that's a, that's a forest area, which is in the Tekna area. And we took the forest floor, parts of the forest floor, and brought it to the areas of the camp and re replanted some of these species because this is all the same forest floor that used to be. So basically taking the forest floor and reintroducing it uh, to the area to help the nature to kind of repair itself. So it's a process of repairing and we call it co-creating with the nature. So helping nature to recreate and uh, uh, repair itself. Uh, we also work with the host community, which is the Bangladeshi community. Um, many of these areas where the Rohingya refugees are living, uh, many of these people used to have their livelihood around that forest area. And because of the, because of this um, long standing uh, transitional <laughs> habitat of refugees in this area, most of these people have um, you know, became, didn't have proper livelihood. So farmers were not able to farm their lands. So they moved from their own houses to different locations. So one of the projects of the World Food Program is to bring in people who are, who can farm. So most of their um, members are women. It's actually women farmers who are uh, now doing small bits of farming of their own and they bring their fresh produce to sell in a, in a center. So we were given the responsibility to design these aggregation centers where uh, they can um, bring their produce and sell. So again, this happens the same way we have workshop, we try to understand their needs. So the program is always with a workshop, working with the community to understand what their needs are. And then based on that to create something which is uh, which they can then uh, work with. And so the first aggregation center that we built, um, which is in Teknaf area for the host community, um, basically it's again a bamboo structure, natural material working with that. And we took the same idea of using steel joints to, to strengthen the bamboo structure uh, so that it, we can be 
create a larger space. And so this is, uh, again, a different kind of a structure, not the same one that you've seen earlier. And here, um, uh, the lower level would be the place where women bring their fresh produce to sell, and there will be a shop. And on the upper place, upper deck, there will be entirely for women to come and sit and to have their own um, little space to enjoy. So this is after we finished, uh, we had it open. We had the opening uh, um, last month. Uh, so this was a, a very happy moment for all of us, including the women farmers who actually thinks that they, uh, they have uh, a lot of input into the making of the building. Um, and so as you see here, the fresh produce by the women's organic So it has a small double height space, some light coming into that space, um, but entirely built with bamboo and uh, steel joints. This is from the upper deck, the stairs, and the facades are all made out of bamboo. Uh, this is where, this is entirely for the women. Uh, so there is a childcare area where uh, this is uh, a separate room and this entire space is for women to um, to come together and, and just have their own space to be. This is another structure or another um, aggregation center now under construction. And um, basically women uh, from that area, again, um, having their own, uh, you know, they come to the site, they also try to understand what's happening. They also have their own input into that uh, entire process. So th there is a sense of feeling of ownership, which is very important uh, whenever you're building any, any building. So again, the uh, entire process has architects involved, community architects doing workshop, also being on site, helping uh, with the construction. Um, and so basically that's how it's going on. If we have time, I could probably just show one or two little projects. I mean, this is just a um, sort of a project which we did um, maybe five, seven years ago uh, in the southern part of Bangladesh. So the southern part of Bangladesh, which is close to the Bay of Bengal, is uh, we have the, uh, the Shundarbans, which is the largest mangrove forest under threat of the climate change and the sea level rise. And close to the site, we have, close to Shundarbon, we have this site, uh, which was given to us uh, to build a resort. Um, and I would say the reason this project is important to me is because this was the, probably the first time I went to um, a, a place and spent time out of the city of Dhaka. So um, I was born and brought up in the city of Dhaka. That's where I've lived all my life. My connection to village wasn't really that, that profound in that sense. So when uh, in 2011, when I went to the site uh, and, and really spent time looking at the area, talking to people, for the very first time, I actually was in the real Bangladesh, which is the delta, the flatland, the farmland, and really connected with people to understand how they live. And, and the living... Uh, with, with, with this very symbiotic relationship with uh, nature it was absolutely um, you know, revel revelatory in many ways. It was a revelation for me. So that's the site, as you see, this is the river, the Kopotako, which goes by the site. Uh, the surrounding is absolute farmland. You see beautiful paddy fields and people live with the minimum of footprints. And it really feels sad that this entire issue of global climate change, where you know uh, these people have the minimum of footprint, are the people who are actually facing the maximum threat of existence, and, and that is such an injustice. And that's when it really feels wrong, and and feels that we need to do something about this. Um, so that was the first site visit, and I thought that the roaring noise of architecture doesn't really make sense in this area. It's about learning from the land, and that's what we did. We tried to understand how people actually build, 
that was probably my first time when I realized that this standard standardization of construction is wrong. You just cannot go somewhere and start building something. You need to learn from the land and to go there to understand it and to, to first to learn with respect and then to improvise or to bring in your own knowledge and to create something which then makes sense. So when we go to a site like this in a flatland of Bangladesh, it's so flat that the first act of building is creating a landscape activity, which is digging a pond. So you dig a pond, you take the earth, you create a mound, and on the mound, you place the house. Um, and the houses are, especially in this area, are just small huts. And basically taking all these different components of a household, this could be a program of a house, and taking these elements and placing them around a courtyard uh, which is not really distinctly defined, but uh, just a space. And then all the elements are surrounding it like an ensemble. And um, every courtyard of a village is connected one, one with the other. So it's a very social communal way of living. So we did uh, extensive study and documentation of the villages. Uh, as you see here, this is one of the villages, the Potter's Village. Then we also did uh, documentation of the weaver's village. And every village is different based on the skill and how they build their houses and the courtyards are absolutely uh, derived from the skills that they have in that area. So, yeah, so we basically created a very interesting connection with the people who live there and how they live and, you know, the, the very minimal that they require. So that was quite an interesting um, experience and learning. This is an interesting form, which is the Bangla roof, uh, a pitch, which is a curved pitch, um, which actually helps to get the rainwater down in a very, very fast, and it doesn't let the thatch rot. The same idea was taken by the Mughals in their forts, and also the same roof form you see in, the, in many of the temples in Bangladesh. So it's very unique of Bengal. So that was, a, again, you don't see that anymore. So we thought of reviving that idea of a, a curved pitch, which is the Bangla roof. So that's our site. Um, we can access from the river and we have an access road. And so based on that, we kind of tried to create an idea of what we want in terms of uh, master planning, creating road network and the houses. We wanted them to be a very uh, communal village-like atmosphere. So we decided to create a hut, create huts. And these huts will have a toilet facility and a room and um, will be surrounded in a courtyard formation. So every house has a nice little courtyard of their own um, where they can um, experience the authentic life of a Bengali living in a Delta area. So these are some of the site, some of the people who are living in the, uh, in the site area uh, or surrounding us, um, the younger generation who has no interest in living in the villages. They are looking towards city to move away from villages. The village doesn't offer any opportunities. And our idea was how we can, how can we keep these younger generation interested in their own land and bring back that pride that is lost uh, from the villages. So we engage them in the whole process of construction and um, bringing them on board, basically using local materials entirely, sun-dried mud brick, mud mortar, um, engaging the entire village. So the whole local economy was developed from the, from the land. And, um, and, and again, this roof form, which, was, which is completely lost, and also the thatching you don't see anymore because you cannot find anybody who can thatch these days. So um, we found two team of people from a certain area. We brought them in. And, and this is a kind of a weaving technique of doing the roofing. So we did that. We also have women working on the site. Um, and so basically that's how we started to grow the entire um, uh, resort. Um, completely, you know, knowledge, that is coming out of the land and bringing in our own knowledge of construction and bringing it together in a way that, that it's not the same as living in the village. You see there's a difference, but the difference is so minimal that um, it does not really 
rupture the dynamics that actually existed in the land. So that's the riverside view, as you see here. And we also have these uh, community workshops. We engage the community. We try to build up their own environment, living environment, so that it can be a better living. So it's a, uh, uh, we call it, Pani, this, this resort is called Panigram. So it's a Panigram community initiative through which we do different kinds of uh, activities craft diversification workshops, savings group, mapping the community, all these activities are there. And very close to the site is again, another architect who's working there, Hasibul Kubir with his office co-creation, who, who is absolutely a very integral part of this whole process with us. And there in Jinaida, he has built these houses, which are $1,500 houses, which is two-story brick houses, uh, being an immature delta, this doesn't move. So these are stable locations where they can build their own houses. Um, and so this is, a, again, another process where they do mapping, aspirational house, and then from there, building their own buildings. When I was teaching at Harvard GSD, uh, my students uh, were given the responsibility of designing these $2,000 home projects, where the students came and visited these houses, which are possible in $1,500. So we gave them this idea. And so they tried out all these different materials that's available on site, uh, how to build with that very hands-on. Um, and then from there, getting an understanding of what is possible. And also connecting with uh, local villagers uh, to, to understand what their needs are. So the aspiration of people is very important. they what they want, what they need. And, and to come together at a point where the, the client and the architect becomes, you know, like partner in design. So it's a process of co-creation and where um, that's how we sort of worked on it and the students understood the process. And um, yeah, so the, every design that was done, they had to prove that this is possible within $200. Um, so these are some of the student works. Uh, this is one where he tried to use the facade as a as a place of storage because the land was limited. Uh, this is a women, uh, three women's house where there is no men, male member. So they created a tea stall for the women so that they can earn some living from there. And so that became a book, which is a $2,000 home co-creating in the Bengal Delta. This was also the same idea we took to Venice Biennale uh, in Arsenale, where we were given this courtyard uh, during uh, 2018. And the curator's idea was free space. So we took the idea of the courtyard um, and created that in Venice. The idea of a courtyard to us is a is idea of a free space. Um, and we took all the different elements from the households and kind of created an, an interesting um, installation of a courtyard of a Bengali hut, which you can see here. Yeah, so these are all really interesting elements and still in use. So that was quite, uh, quite amazing. So I think I'll finish it here. Um, I think I'm running out of time. So thank you all for listening. Wow, what a, what a great way to start the day. Thank you um, very much, uh, Marina, for an inspiring lecture, uh, very much connected to how we can engage and understand both um, local and global uh, pressing issues. So thank you very much for that. And I think your lecture will also link very well with our next uh, uh, table on the creative process for which I would like to hand over to our own Kate Davis, head of um, um, media studies and uh, director of Hope Park, uh, who will introduce our, our, our panel. And just once again, thank you very much, Marina. Thank you for coming. Hey, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Angel. Um, hi, everyone. Hi in the room. Hi in the virtual room. Um, well, when I got 
uh, the email telling me the list of speakers that I was going to be um, chairing today, I was like, oh, what a joy. Um, it's one of those, those moments where you realize your job's actually awesome. Uh, so we've got three people talking under the panel, um, creative process. Um, we've got Tom Emerson, Zoe Lachlan, and Mark West, who will be up there online. Um, and I think all three really are kind of dealing in some way with, with pretty direct engagement with stuff, with the, the kind of, with the, the thing that, the matter, the, the reality of, of the, the kind of subject of their creative process, if you like. Um, so, and I think this is obviously a super important part of what we do, educating architects, um, symposium, educating creativity. Um, and the creative process is a kind of mysterious one. And I hope that, you know, hopefully that comes out um, through the presentations by these three and through the conversation afterwards. So we've got 15 minutes uh, for each speaker, kind of back to back, and then we'll have a bit of time for a Q&A and some conversation. Um, I'm going to introduce each of them kind of as they speak. Um, Tom Emerson, obviously friend of the AA, is, <laughs> doesn't need much introduction to a lot of you, um, was a teacher at the AA, um, an external examiner at the AA, a member of council, um, co-founder of 6A Architecture, obviously with Stephanie MacDonald. Um, and a large part of his practice is, is producing spaces uh, for arts and education. Um, he's Dean of Architecture at ETH and leads um, a studio exploring the relationship between landscape making and ecology. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much, Kate, um, and Manija for the invitation. Um, Marina for that amazing, really kind of amazing talk uh, to start with. And I have to... Uh, um, Many themes echo, although the, co the context couldn't be more different, either in terms of the challenges we face or indeed the privilege that we come from um, in this work, which is coming from Zurich. Um, just a little note on the pictures are just kind of flashing, are just passing on a kind of loop. Um, the title um, always starts with a number and that is the number of people involved in the work that's um, passing in front of you. Um, and it, they date from more or less the last decade, except for the one that just passed, which was actually here. It was called Two Kinds of Wild, around about 2003. My dates are a little bit blurry, but it is a long time ago. Um, and I suppose that the, the thought that I wanted to sort of share today in terms of this notion of um, educating creativity, both terms which I find quite difficult, um, I don't think that I've ever met a really creative pro person who's ever actually used the word. Um, and when it comes to educating, that's another, another um, thing altogether. But I guess that's why we're here at the AA, that's why I spend a lot of my time um, at ETH. Um, and I suppose what it's, what it's pointing towards is maybe um, the idea that education and the project of architecture and the individual that produced it has traditionally been a really neat and compact kind of product that um, the, the student arrives at um, architecture school, art college, university as an individual, works individually, produces individual works uh, or research um, or installations, is assessed on them, and then they're sent out into the world as an individual um, <coughs> through this process of kind of authorship, I guess. And the last decade or so has been 
um, for me, a process of trying to explore other means of working and other means to creativity, other means to generate knowledge, other means of design. And maybe it touches on a lot of the things that uh, Marina was talking about when she was talking about re, 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 kind of reuse, repair, um, res restoration, um, and lots of kind of notions of architecture and design, many of which actually were introduced to me by Irene sitting there, who um, shared this essay by Bruno Latour from about 2009, I think, on design. I think it's called A Cautious Prometheus. Um, but... Um, uh, so the, um, the notion of kind of other ways of practicing or other ways of producing not just design and structures but also producing knowledge that happens in a kind of fluid, fluid exchange between many people. And of course that's reflected in new types of practice. I mean, I think that over the last decade we've seen many practices emerged that really challenged the notion of the author, lots of collectives, lots of, lots of even kind of spontaneous collectives that then reform themselves around different uh, tasks, different um, uh, occasions. So um, I suppose that it's really about kind of a new, maybe new, other ways of learning, other ways of researching, other ways of designing being that design is only ever redesign. And here, all of these are somewhere between one and 200 people. Um, um, surveys being also an equal, let's say equal and equivalent to any other form of spatial production or design. The survey, which I sort of see as being like a kind of metaphor for how we should be acting, as in more in the act of observation, selecting, documenting, before the act of making. Um, that observation and documentation is a form of production in and of itself. And I think Marina talked about that with the mapping projects um, and all the kind of engagement um, that she talked about. But of course, the outputs are much harder to control. They're much harder to control the design process, much harder to control the evaluation process. I mean, just above us are the famous room where the tables happen, you know, which is a particularly a kind of um, uh, important ritual in the life of the student at the AA and the life of the AA. And of course, every educational institution has its own version of it. Um, and um, so then it puts lots of challenges onto how we not only produce, but how we um, evaluate. Um, and of course, it also gives us lots of opportunities. I mean, ob at a really obvious level, working with many people, you can actually produce structures. You can actually produce space. And there are plenty of examples of small projects here that have been done in um, Zurich, actually some of them. Uh, one of them in Peru, um, but uh, mainly mainly in and around Zurich. Um, but of course, many people can also produce a, much more knowledge. And I think that that's where the surveys or the atlases, as we call them, kind of are an opportunity to um, produce much more extensive, much more kind of far-reaching um, uh, kind of the design methods and documentations. Um, that can actually last then much longer. So it's not just a kind of quantitative thing. It's not just a kind of structural or physical thing. It's also a temporal one that if you make these studies, you bring, they last a great deal longer perhaps than the thing. And this project, which is flashing over you at the moment, is um, a garden project at ETH. It started about seven years ago. And I suppose it hits maybe the kernel of what I was interested in, which is that education, arts education, project education, cannot simulate the passage of time. It is one of the most impossible things because we are so locked into a semester, a term, um, an academic year, and uh, a part one, a part two, all these kind of structural elements that, that, that surround us. When in fact, the passage of time is the very subject 
of what we do. And so um, it's a way of being able to work collectively, but also to work naturally, also to invoke the notion of care. So those uh, garden projects, every cycle of student works on the same project as the previous cycle. And the only rule being that they can add whatever they like as long as they don't damage what came before and they have to care for what came before. So there is a sort of custodial responsibility to the designer, as well as a kind of, kind of uh, synthetic and creative one. So it's really about these notions of kind of conservation, restoration, um, and kind of um, uh, maybe trying to find ways of not talking about nature or even not talking about time but about working naturally and within a kind of continuum, which might then help us to kind of connect with, for example, the people that Marina talked about who move three times in a lifetime, or all the other temporal and seasonal cycles that are now the kind of the heart of what we do. Thank you. Um, thank you. Oh, I get um, my mask my on all the way. Oh. No, no, yours was fine. Yours was fine. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to stop this. It's going to keep on flashing until somebody stops it. <laughs> have to start again. <laughs> Behind the mask, it was very good, Irene. <laughs> Is this mic on? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, amazing. Thank you, Tom. Um, so we're going to move to Zoe, Zoe Lachlan. Um, Zoe is the co-founder and director of the Institute of Making at UCL, just up the road. Um, she's multi-talented and her work exists in, in this kind of beautiful space between things. Um, between the science, art, craft and design of materials essentially. Um, so from experiments with matter to large scale public ex exhibitions and events. Um, I was in my kitchen the other day in a voice popped up on Radio 4, um, talking about, what was it, Apple Crumble or something. Um, so a really amazing sight of, of materials in their kind of wider spectrum. Um, so I'll pass over to Zoe, thank you. Last, last time, yeah. yeah. Once, once Can by, do. You know, I was told by um, Ken Campbell, who's a theatre director, Zoe, you do great face! You do great face. So I'm going to do my best face for you now to earn having my mask off. Um, right. So, yes, thanks for having me. Um, in terms of what I'm going to talk about, I'm not showing any slides because I want to sh talk about things and stuff and be in the real physical space with them because that's actually very much at the heart of what the Institute of Making is about. So by way of context, um, the Institute of Making is a real physical space. We exist sort of diagonally across the... Um, square, up a bit and around a bit. So we're on Mallet Street. We're part of UCL, so University College London, and administratively, like we, we, we tap into the pipe work of the engineering faculty. Right? So we are part of the engineering faculty, but we stand as a cross-faculty institute, so we are for the entire university. And anybody at UCL can become a member of the Institute of Making, and that means you do an induction, and then your card works and you can come in and you can use the stuff. And so that means you could be an undergraduate architecture student at the Bartlett or you could be doing your PhD in astrophysics or you could be doing anthropology. You can be a lecturer in the medical school. You can have a part-time job in the library. You could be a cleaner. If you have a UCL ID card, you can use our space. And we have two sort of overarching rules in some respects, which is no weapons, don't be an arsehole. So it, that's, and if after that, pretty much anything goes. We're not f um, f part of any formal teaching. And um, in terms of educating creativity, I think it's actually quite important that we're not teaching. We are interested in learning, maybe, but it's, it's, it's not curriculum focused. We're not related to a course. You can't come in and say, I've got a deadline tomorrow. Everybody else, get out of my way. Like, our members are equal, and all projects are equal. And we provide a space for stuff to happen. Well, 
for people to get up to things and for stuff to get up to the things as well. Um, physically, it's like a sort of hangar. Uh, we have a materials library. It sort of maybe th imagine sort of three or four of this room and then a bit more on the side. But we have um, a materials library up one end and we have our workshop at the other. But it's one big void and one big shared space. And um, we have a, a 10 ton gantry crane in case we want to lift stuff up. And it's, it's, it's a working space and any one day it might be different. But in some respects, the materials library is kind of at the heart of us because it is about at the heart of making. And that making for me really is materials and processes. So we have our tools, we have our kit and we have our materials library. But it's there to give you stuff and things to get hands on with. So I'm going to talk a little bit about materials and how we think about them and how that is a kind of methodology for approaching making. But also, rather like, um, <laughs> rather like the, the resistance to both the word creativity and education earlier. Like, it's not something we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, I really come out in a rash when someone comes, oh, I see what you guys do, you're an innovation space or something. And I just, Bleh. you know, it's really kind of a prickly feeling because the reason you use those words is if it's, they mean quite a lot to certain people. And like in a funding, can, a funding situation, in a, in a proposal, you understand why you might use a word like creative or innovative. But actually, I really deeply believe that it's like... Um, it's not for the person who's doing it to decide whether it is or not. Like, imagine if you're very beautiful. It's not for that person to go, I'm very beautiful. Do you see what I mean? And then they're just the asshole. It's like that is decided by external factors. Like, if something is innovative, that's for something external to go, that's sort of innovative. Like, if you're in it, to start deciding it's innovative is already you're sort of killing it and it makes it not really possible to do it and... It's just, yeah, anyway, so there's a lot of interesting things that hopefully we can tease out in the discussion that I think relate to that. But I really see what we're doing at the Institute of Making is creating an ecosystem. So it's creating an environment with a, vi a huge diversity of stuff going on. Because if you're interested in interesting things happening, then you don't know where it might bubble up from. So you need to have many different things happening simultaneously. So that might be, you know, and, and that comes out in how we like lay out make simple decisions about kit. So for example, we have potter's wheels and wood lathes and milling machines, and they're sort of together, which wouldn't happen in a normal workshop environment because someone might say, well, why, you don't want wood dust in the clay, blah, blah, blah. But they're about stuff turning and spinning around and being shaped. And actually a potter's wheel goes this way and a wood lathe goes that way, but it's about spinning. And you're, there's a, so there's a spinning area and there's a kind of hot area. And in the hot area, you have glue guns and blow torches, but also an oven and a microwave and like and hair dryers and like lots of things that get hot. And then we'll move, we'll move the tools around to kind of curate them and see different relationships between tools and processes. And similarly in the materials library, imagine floor to ceiling kind of rows of stuff and shelves and things but they, we move it around, and it's not a library in the sense of that you would find where books are, where it, this lives there, and it's got a number, and the number means it's shelf two, and it's literature, it's it's Greek mythology or something. Like the number isn't about anything other than time. So um, things get a number when they come into the library, but that just means it's the seven hundred and eighth thing to come in if it's seven oh eight, and the next thing will be seven oh nine, and that when that and if that thing breaks and we might get another one it doesn't get that number it gets a new number because it's because one of the very important things about materials and processes is that it's time based and that it's not really the same thing anymore so for example we've got a mars bar which um sits happily in a little jar and but that's a very specific mars bar it's like a 7 year old mars bar that's lived in that jar for 7 years not in its wrapper and if someone was to eat it and we were to replace it it wouldn't be the same Mars bar, actually, and it would look very different. So it's quantifiably, measurably, scientifically different stuff, even though it's just a Mars bar. Anyway, so I'm itching to show you some things because I think it's, it's important to be hands-on. I'm going to try and pass them around, but also I'm aware that there's people at home who hopefully can see things. Oh, look, I can see myself. Oh, good. Okay. Well, let's begin with, I want to talk about, I think, persistence and um, the raw, because I think... 
it's sort of interesting that back to that time-based thing, materials are always in process. And we talk about raw materials sometimes, but that's extremely relative. And one person's raw material is a new person's starting point. So this is a, a piece of malachite. So this is a rock um, from which we extract copper. Can we see that if I put that against my jumper? Or I now can see the camp person shape following it around. Sorry, I'll keep still. Um, so this is a rock which we extract, we process to extract copper. So copper is a pure element on the periodic table. We have an idea of what it's like conceptually, but when it exists, it's always a bit different. It has different impurities, but it's a, it's a, it's a pure element, but at the same time, it's a very process and made thing because it's got to go through a process of mining and extraction and commodification. You know, people die to get this rock here in my hand, right here, right now. It's a serious business. And, but this is also a made thing in terms of it's gone through a geological process process of making and so to then make copper is a huge process of making and then when you make the copper are you then ten, ten, you know generating copper sheet or copper pipes or copper powder like if you want to make alloys of metals actually you want to deal with powders because think about baking you can weigh out 20 grams of a powder much more easily than you can definitely saw off 20 grams from an ingot you know so like you deal with metals in their powder forms to then mix them together but a powdered metal is a really sophisticated made thing that's really quite difficult to get right with the consistent grain size and so it's a sort of relativeness of the raw I kind of want to throw out there and also it, it taps into other words like natural which is again extremely relative and the problem is it can be so easily aligned with good, right? And actually, if this was an extremely natural piece of uranium, you'd probably be thinking, this isn't, this isn't good for me, and this isn't a good... You know, this is, there's a lot of harm in natural, and I think we just need to watch when we talk about materials that we align them with things, which I don't think is fair to put onto them. Um, so the raw and the, then the fixed, I think, is also interesting in relation to materials and process and the tension around the fixed. And I actually purposely mean fixed like held somehow stationary, but also fixed like repaired, because both are important. Um, this is a, a, a glass vial, mini vase. I'm not an archaeologist. I wouldn't know how we would cl classify this taxonomy, but... This is Roman, so this is nearly 2,000 years old. And this is a piece of glass. And we all know that I could really break this pretty easily, actually. I'm already feeling quite vulnerable putting it, holding it up because we know we've all broken something made of glass and it's not beyond the realms of a child's strength to break it. But actually, it's still it's very happily existing and staying there. As long as you don't apply that mechanical force to it, it will just sit there and it can happily sit there in some mud in the ground for eternity, essentially. Like that's not going anywhere. And it will slowly change over time. But our perception of things changing and the immutability of materials is very re relevant and very transient and interesting when you're building something like a materials library. Like once you've extracted the copper that I spoke about earlier, actually the minute it exists to copper, it would quite like to just return back to malachite. Like it wants to bind with oxygen in the air and and essentially go green and corrode and t go back to the ore. So you're dealing with these things that are in constant process. But the fixed also relates to kind of fixing things and making things and repair. Like you can't make stuff without breaking stuff. Like this is really important. And knowing that that's going to happen, like, oh, I'm going to break this really perfect ingot of something to then melt it and turn it into something else or I'm going to saw it off this lovely bit of lumber like you, you destroy things in order to make them but also when you're fixing something you're making a very overt statement about the care and we talk about self-care in the world like in the public discourse that's known but I don't think there's enough to talk about thing care and stuff care and like that sort of appreciation and we have a number of research projects that look at our relationships to materials and repair and fixing and it even sort of bleeds into prosthetics, where we look at actually what are prosthetes, uh, working with people who actually have limbs. So it's not about a missing limb and then adding something on. It's like saying you have a limb and it's not working in the way you would like it to. Can you do something and in that would help it? So, for example, this is a very, very quick and dirty prototype. But the point is 
there is a man and he's, he's um, paralysed, but he has hands, he just can't use them. So actually, we've built a system of gloves where, with a voice-activated control box, he can go left pinch and the motor pulls these two strings and it will pinch his fingers. Or left grip and it pulls the whole thing down. And once that starts curling, the whole hand sort of comes down. So it, it's sort of caring and noticing things that materials and processing can do. Um, caring for stuff, this is, this is nice. This is a piece of the blackest black, famous, isn't it? It's, there's been various iterations of the blackest black, which I think is nice over the years. And that's the kind of world of superlative materials. They're only the winner for a little bit. But this was blackest black as made by NASA. And then they said, or as I've asked they would donate a bit. And they said, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll send you a bit. It's, it's in an exhibition at the moment. And then when it's finished there, it will come to you. And you can just have it. And then when it rocks up, it's kind of grey. And you're like, oh, bloody hell, it's not very black. But you, what you realise is what it is also is very fragile. So it's all crumbled away and it's not really black anymore. So things can be really good at some stuff and sort of terrible at others. Um, I'm aware of the time. This is my 15 minutes. Hopefully I've seeded a few things. Um, I did want to talk about... Oh, I'll give you one last provocative, one last statement, which is when... Um, I'm talking to students in more of an educational context and trying to tease things out. I'd like to sort of say, well, you might think of yourself as a designer or an engineer, but what would it mean to be a materials farmer and to think differently about time frames of materials? As I grew up, two, both sides of my family are farmers, and I was very used to conversations around the dinner table being like, Zoe, when you're 50, you've got to chop this down. And I'm like, right, okay, you know. Like, you're sort of being given instructions for a sense of time, which even when you're, not, you know, you're nine years old, that seems like an eternity away. And it's definitely, maybe even when my parents are dead, and this is my grandfather telling me something to do. And, like, systems and time frames and materials that are bigger than our own lifespans is what we need to start designing within especially in the kind of materials and making world. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, we have next, we have Mark West, who's on the screen somewhere, I hope. There you are. Hi, Mark. Nice Hello. to see you. Hey. Um, Mark's a, a teacher, an artist, an inventor, a builder, a researcher, probably go on um, many things um, he's he's known of course for his work with um, and his kind of inventive and experimental work uh, with fabric formwork techniques um, founder of cast uh, the center of architectural structures and technologies in Winnipeg Manitoba um, now working independently with his atelier uh, surviving logic um, He's also now external examiner for the Design and Make program down at Hook Park. Um, so I'm personally very excited to have him as part of the panel. Um, so I, I'll hand over to Mark. Thanks, Mark. Well, you know, um, I took the remit very seriously and very literally. So I'm actually going to uh, I'll talk directly as I can about the creative process. It's, it's, it's an, an old horse that we all like to whip, but I'll, I'll, I'll go at it myself and see what happens. Uh, I suppose that it goes without saying that there are different ways of making and thinking and different, different ways, uh, different states of mind for various kinds of making. Uh, so an artist, an engineer, builder, uh, architect uh, have different creative processes, we could say. Um, uh, so for example, what we call artistic creation uses a special kind of errantry, a uh, wandering, where the final creation uh, unpredictably unfolds itself to the maker. And often the author cannot say what it's about at all until long after the work has been completed. The engineering creation is essentially creative problem solving, as I see it. it requires well-constrained problems described by quantitative constraints, and, so and solutions are judged in large part uh, quantitatively, and material efficiency, costs, and so forth. Although I, I don't want to downplay the role that intuition plays uh, in engineering uh, and completely rational 
uh, or putatively uh, rational enterprises. But I'll talk more about intuition in a little bit. Good architecture is far more than a creative problem solving. Indeed, there may not be a problem at all. Uh, architecture asks the question, fundamentally, how shall we live? And any answer to this question raises questions of what matters most, what matters least. And these are difficult questions, inviting values and ethics and desire uh, to take center stage. Uh, now, much more can be said about all of this, uh, but uh, certainly any design from rockets to jewelry, uh, uh, there's never any optimum, even in engineering design. There is no optimum. There are always multiple solutions out there, each one better in its own particular way. Uh, initial criteria are likely to change during a design process. The promise of a good idea is often overturned in the next and the next iteration. The solution is always a moving target. And the final outcome always feels like a surprise, doesn't it? Like this, uh, where did this come from feeling when you look at the, at your, at the final design, the final decisions? Intuition is invaluable in this process, but intuition is only gained through experience. And as they say, good judgment is based on experience, but experience is based on bad judgment. Mistakes are, ine are inevitable and they are golden. An embrace of mistakes is key. Inventions, after all, are always found rather than formulated. They cannot be formulated. The unknown is unknown. And this is why the history of technology is largely a history of mistakes, the broken beaker, the fortuitous misunderstanding. A laboratory is essentially an enclosed space set apart from the larger world, where by means of cunning changes in scale, a large number of mistakes can be made in a short period of time. Uh, I owe Bruno Latour uh, for this uh, concise definition. Now, the same may be said of a studio. Mistakes provide the richest veins of new ideas and instruction. Rather than regret, an attitude of, hey, look, look what happened is key. Now, in academia, in teaching, this presents a conundrum. Because how can we ask a student to embrace mistakes in a school where their work is ultimately to be judged with the attendant rewards and punishments? That's a problem. And part of the answer, it seems to me, is to be able to foster a state of play. So the play state is not just uh, frolicking, uh, but to play as in a play, which is to say to pretend. Uh, and, the, and the etymology of pretend is very beautiful. It, it means to stretch ahead, to pretend. Uh, so this is an expansion in the play state. It's an expansion towards an unknown just to see what happens. And here, I, I also want to make a distinction between fantasy and reality, or fantasy and what I would further define as a, a reality-based imagination. So between fantasy and imagination. Fantasy, uh, I'll describe as a free-floating wish fulfillment or a dread fulfillment in its dystopian mode as opposed to imagination, which would be an, an excellently constrained imagination, a projection of a possible reality that does not yet exist, but which could exist using existing materials, tools, procedures, obeying the laws of nature and so forth. And then uh, to be able to imagine so vividly that a judgment can be made about the affect of such a construction. So what would it be like if, what would it be like uh, and finally, I'm just going to give some quick examples of a material, materially based method of creation and research using physical parametric models 
in a studio-based laboratory. And this is the, um, from the, the work, my work at CAST. Uh, so let's do this. Let me share this and go here. See that? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. So the fabric formwork research um, that I did at CAS was carried out within some rather severe constraints of simplicity. Only flat sheets of fabric were used. Only the most basic tools and fasteners were used making our work accessible to both high and low building cultures and economies. The work was focused uh, primarily on reducing concrete and steel and formwork materials. And I did this work together with uh, research associate Ronnie Araya and many, many students. Abstractly, we imagined through drawings and experimentally, we imagined through small physical models contrived to function as much like their full-scale counterparts as possible. These are physical parametric models, which is to say physical analogs, analogies of full-scale construction. We worked as co-designers with the assistance of the material world, that is with the material's own spatial and physical imagination, so to speak, uh, and using them as our teachers and our partners. In this process, little models as small as one to 10 proved to be extraordinarily accurate predictors of full-scale events. These models are not merely scaled objects, but scaled actions. They're verb-like as well as noun-like. These are physical parametric models where the parameters are given by the, hate, by the behavior of the materials themselves, which is why the choice of the analog materials is so crucial. I wanted also to describe here, I'm gonna just stop this. Also wanted to describe the studio laboratories of Heinz Eisler, Fry Otto and Anthony Gaudi. But there's really only time here to invoke their names as great dead teachers in the realm of materially informed creative processes. Um, I'm gonna come back. Am I back? Yeah. Okay. Oops, stop that. Yeah, so Heinz Eastler, Fry Otto, and Anthony Gaudi, especially Gaudi's a studio, but we'll have, we'll have just really not enough time to get into any of that stuff. So I will make just a, four more final points. Um, first is that the arrival of digitally driven design and production tools can function in an analogous way to the studio laboratories already mentioned. For example, emerging tools of, uh, for emerging tools for human machine co-design using digital parametrics, genetic algorithms, evolutionary optimi optimization programs, so forth. That, that these, these tools help develop unexpected technical and geometric solutions for consideration. That is, so long as the constraints and parameters in play reflect the constraints and parameters of the physical world. In other words, not a geometric fantasy but an excellently constrained physical imagination, a kind of machine imagination. Two, each location, culture, and economy has its own set of available materials and tools. So materially driven or materially assisted ideas and creation are in this sense, very local and collectively constrained. And then the last two points are some invisible factors in the creative process that I think need to be mentioned. So there is an intensely personal psychological interior landscape within which each of us works. State of mind is all important to creation. There's a rhythm perhaps, and certainly a kind of internal weather that feeds or hinders a desire to make and the courage to wander and find. There are rituals of approach, 
There are times to act and there are times to give it a rest. This interior landscape can be haunted by ego, habit, fears of judgment, and other shadowed pitfalls. And I would say that is wanted most, above all for an architect, is empathy in this landscape. Navigating this landscape involves a very private kind of confessional education that a teacher cannot teach. Although it serves us well, both teacher and student, to be reminded that pursuing this interior education is also part of the job. And finally, the last point that I'd like to make in this is that the creator of a design, it seems to me, requires three separate personas, each taking a turn at the wheel. First, there's the author, who at best should be utterly in love with their work. Second is the critic, who is only in love with truth and will set the author straight in no uncertain terms when the work comes up short. And third, there's the job captain, whose eye is on the clock and whose job it is to keep the other two co-workers in harness and in line. Cool. If any of these personas do not show up to work, uh, the work will fail. That's, that's what I've prepared for you, and I guess that's it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, brilliant, as always. Um, I'm going to probably kick off with a, a question, maybe two, and then I think it'd be really nice to open it out to questions from the room, questions from the Zoom, um, and also maybe questions that you have for each other. It'd be quite nice. Um, I think the, the, the super obvious um, strand for me that that kept popping out uh, across all of your talks, um, and also with Marina's talk earlier, was this idea of uh, co-design, co collaboration. Marina called it co-creation, the collective. Um, and whether that is a kind of co-design with the environment, with material, even computation. Um, I wonder what your thoughts on given the, the subject of this symposium and how that sits with the architectural, the model for architectural education um, that we have at the moment or has kind of been historically the norm um, and the idea of maybe the, the hero architect, um, the star architect coming out of that, um, the student project that that is a, a sole creation in a vacuum maybe sometimes um, yeah I wondered if anyone wants to talk to that well, well, just... uh... Mark Mark um, I, w I was uh, educated in the uh, in the in the hero architect mode that was that that was the only the only possible way you could operate and um and you know have very mixed feelings about it because on the one hand the focus on an individual's ideas and individual work of a student allows a person who's who who's the student to to um, to learn a great deal about themselves, and that's quite rare, you know, in education. So that's a that's a great value of, of the concentration on individual work, individual ideas, and all of that. Uh, so that certainly, you know, I would hate to see that jettison. But uh, uh, but on the other hand, it's completely unrealistic, <laughs> and kind of. Um, slightly you know, like we could say a destructive way of working you know and certainly in the profession and, and in the world it seems it's just wrong and it doesn't doesn't happen anyway it's always a collective enterprise um and then the other thing that i think about that is that as a teacher i don't know how you all feel about it but when i would do group projects it was always a kind of trepidation of doing that 
because, and this is so stupid, but it's real, uh, that it, it makes the marking really difficult, if not impossible. So because we're responsible for evaluating and marking students, and it's a, I think there's a, 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 an understandable, although stupid and unfortunate resistance to the group work, just simply because of that. That's a confessional. Yes, that's a, 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 something I recognize. I'm sorry. Yeah, your question put me in mind of an observation I make all the time. Within our workshop at the Institute of Making, because UCL has lots of different disciplines going on, and some of them have their own workshops, it's interesting why the people who could go to their own workshop choose not to and choose to come to us. So, for example, the Bartlett School of Architecture has amazing making facilities. But we have quite a lot of architects who become members of the Institute of Making and want to use our space as well. Um, the Slade School of Fine Art, similarly. They have studio space of their own. They have workshops. There's technicians who can support them. But they come and do things in our space. And there's a... You know, when you sort of ask them about it, there are a few things that come up. One is the kind of kit we've got isn't the same as the kit they've got. But also the people we've got in the room aren't the same as the people they've got there. And what they really mean is I'm not surrounded just by other architects doing architecture stuff. I'm not surrounded by other artists just doing fine art stuff. And for some, that's a kind of release of a pressure valve of like, a, a, you know, they, they, the competitive frenzy actually we are much more playful we aren't interested in we're not critiquing this and asking them to contextualize it in 21st century modernism or something like we're not those aren't the questions we're asking but we are saying what if that and oh have you tried it like this and oh god there was a person in the other day in in anthropology who was doing something with butter you, you have a look at their project here do you know what i mean and we actively say from the get-go feel free to just ask people what they're up to on their bench and it's there's there isn't um we know that we're going to inspire each other in there, and that's to be celebrated. It's not copying, and it's not. Um, there's a kind of there's a sort of relax, relaxing of attention that happens when you're surrounded by people with ultimately you're in competition with. I think they feel some of them feel that someone's going to steal your idea. Yeah, yeah, because the reality is they might, and that's what happens, isn't it? We don't. We do know that, and but what we're saying is, okay, in here there's enough different things going on that. We know that like, we'll have someone come in and do something with enameling, and then there's this like, little wave of, oh, I'd like to have a go at enameling. And like, the enameling kiln is like, constantly on. And like, oh, that's interesting. And then you see ideas spawn around. And, but the reality is that that isn't because they've been set an enameling project or that the thing they're making is going to ultimately be placed up against the other person doing something with enamel. So it's just... It's just interesting to observe in relation to what Mark said and your question that when you are making in your alongside people who, whose agenda is very similar to yours, it's different from being alongside people who have a markedly different sort of agenda. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's this notion of the author is, um, is it, it's, particularly focused in education because of the, the whole structural side of, um, of kind of passing through certain kind of portals and achieving certain things. Um, but it's kind of wider as well. I mean, you know, I think maybe I would probably try not to put it as a kind of opposition or a choice that... Um, one has to be either for the collective or for the individual because in this room, you know, everybody's processing their own internal imagination while at the same time everybody's sort of participating in the same um, event. So it's kind of going on all the time. I suppose that maybe what's at work now is, as uh, Mark has mentioned, maybe the hero architect is no longer the aspirational figure. Actually, that's got, it's full of, full of problems that we don't need to really necessarily kind of unpack now. Um, and then it kind of puts lots, of, I think, lots of interesting questions back onto how we work together and how we produce things. And I think Zoe's talked about kind of that quite unique space that there is in the institution, Institute of Making within UCL. It's a kind of, 
And now I would say, you know, just anecdotally, one of the things that's going on um, at ETH that's got a lot of energy behind it is killing the crit. Like it's it's not out, but it's it's definitely being challenged. So and that that has an even higher sense of drama at the AA because it's called the jury, you know. So um, you know, so so like the crit is a bit nasty. The jury is definitely high stakes, you know, guilty or not, you know. So there is so this idea of um, judgment. The other the other way of using the word judgment that Mark was using, the one of the idea that a group of people who know more than you will pass judgment on you, and it's you versus the world. And we know, for example, the open juries. I mean, um, you know, everybody's got crit trauma, right? And um, and it makes good. You know, some of the anecdotes are really good in the bar. But in terms of a learning experience, whether that process is fit for purpose, I think is a really interesting question. And um, if over the past year or the past couple of years, they've been particularly because the the spatial situation has broken down over the last two years. So so has the model. You know, because there was not a room with one poor soul standing up facing people sitting down comfortably you know so there's a kind of lots of kind of complicated spatial political space there um with a room full of a, an appreciative audience you know so um what's been going on now is much more you could say tabletop exchanges much more um self reviews sort of students amongst themselves where you have participating guests but they're not there to judge they're there to participate and to input and I think that that is shifting I mean it doesn't make things like evaluation any easier but to some extent evaluation should not be the tool should never be the tool that determines how you do things um, especially if those things are productive and um, so I think that it's, I don't think it's a kind of individual, I don't think it's an individual versus the collective. I think it's about a more, um, it's more, um, just a more integrated field where all these things can sort of, uh, kind of fizz and operate and, and um, you know, because we still, you know, or I would say, I was going to say still, most of us buy books. Um, you know, they are still usually authored by one person and things written by committee, not so good. Um, so there are still certain fields of production which, are, which are, do come from a, the particularity of somebody's mind, somebody's imagination. But I think that in the production of space and the production and the, the kind of physical material production of space, actually that's a much more complex and engaged process. And I think that I think that as as both as a discipline and as institutions, we should be trying to kind of find find new models. I think they're out there, but um, you know, and I think uh, Institute of Making, other forms of review, you know, all these things, they're all they're all at work at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's basically just kind of following following the the momentum. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think I find the model of the Institute of Making fascinating. How did that come about, that this kind of in, interdisciplinary space could be made at UCL? Oh, I was just saying if they want it, they haven't got a choice. <laughs> I mean, no, it's a bit, uh, putting it a bit oversimplified. But in some respects, it mirrors my own personal educational experience in terms of thinking, isn't it weird how when I went to art college, there were only art books in the library? That was odd. So I'll... And, and, like just, and then going through an educational journey where then I did a PhD in an engineering department and thought, they, all these people need to go to art college. Do you know what, and, and really, it's a sort of thinking, it's thinking to engineering, look, you need a workshop. Your students don't have material knowledge and experience. But the, if we bring the Institute of Making to UCL, we want to open this type of workshop. But the deal is, it's not only for engineers. And in fact, you're failing the engineers if it's only for engineers. And it, it needs to be for everybody. And that um, in doing that, you create this sort of ecosystem, I suppose. And I think, but I don't want to underestimate the importance of people as well. Um, like, this isn't my job, it's a life's work, I suppose. That's one element of it. But 
the team that I'm really protective of and care, you know, employing people is one of the most important moments of my role as a director is because that's it's, it's the culture it's the team it's the gang like when we again when we bought it to UCL they said oh, we've got you know there are some there are technicians maybe we could like but no no I need to employ our own technicians and it's it's much more important like they can learn how to use this tool but what you can't learn is how to bear people and bear talking to them and bear explaining for the 17th time something like that's much more difficult to learn also our technicians we actually i mean we call them technicians and there's contracts and there's hr and there's reasons why they need certain names but really as we would describe it they're kind of hosts of a party you know what i mean they're like oh come on in hi how you doing right you know you're you're a generous host who works the room and makes sure everyone's happy and that if oh have you met Sansa Sanzo and like you're you're there to make the party go with a swing you know, and that, that's the sort of attitude that our team have, I like to think, that helps it being... And if we don't know how to make something, well, well that's an opportunity. Oh, God, right, right, let's look this up together. This, oh, I'd love to have a go at this. And we're in on that journey with them. And sometimes we're, we'll show someone and really take them through step by step. But other times it's like an opportunity to get in on a project and help. That's, that's wonderful, Zoe. That's fantastic. It's, oh, good. It's, um, <laughs> No, that's fantastic. What, um, when, when I built CAST and opened CAST, it was clear to me that this should be a space that when a student walks into the building, they don't feel that they're in school anymore. Mm. And so the, the first tool that we commissioned in the building was a large stereo with four big speakers. <laughs> and, and we filled the space with music. And music was a really crucial part of the atmosphere there. And I mean, besides the people, as you say, which are obviously really important. But this was, a, you know, a device that uh, uh, that I could f fill the space with something where you would know you were in another kind of place where there was where where things were permitted. Yeah. Uh, right. And and uh, I just I, and that's the prerequisite for a certain kind of work and working yeah no i mean, I mean we're building a second space at the moment which will be 10 times bigger all being well and well no it will be i mean it is <laughs> the concrete's poured but um you know a lot of my time is sort of spent telling no no i really do need an, an inbuilt pa system that's going to run they, 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 those things that make things feel as you say you walk in and there's music playing also there's quieter times as well but you know there's times in our week where it, it you know we have a party in the workshop once a year that really is like yeah it's an excuse to really dance and have a good time and it's like yeah. a sort of the it's but it's in the kind of wedding end of the spectrum rather than a student party end of the spectrum in that it's so there's a lot of different people having a really good time in a quite an innocent way <laughs> like i mean i've been to some of the bartlett party parties and they're kind of amazing but like everybody over 25 disappears after the first half an hour whereas ours like they're there all the all for the rest of the night and everyone takes a turn on the stereo and it's a different kind of thing. But anyway, I don't want to monopolize. And, my, and, and, and the other, the other thing I wanted to mention was that my research associate, Rani Araya, who came from Chile from the open city, I don't know if you know the open city group uh, in, in Valparaiso um, or in Ritoque. And he, um, when he came to, to work and play with me, he was kind of appalled that there was no place um, where we could sit at a table and have food. And, and so that he, he, you know, he said, well, you have, you know, you need a table. And so there was a table that was made. And then, and even though it was illegal, according to certain university regulations for, to have food in there, we did anyway. And that was another kind of crucial social um, it's not even, well, yeah, it's social, but it, again, it really has to do with the state of mind that you're in while you're in a, in a workspace. But talking of Kate's first question about collaboration, actually, I have a few rules around collaboration. And one is, if you're not prepared to have lunch with them, don't do a project with them. Like, if you can't, <laughs> like, good. what are you doing? So it's, it's, okay, there's, low, there's like a million pounds worth of grants available, but don't sign up for a three-year thing if you don't feel like you'd enjoy going, having, hanging out, having lunch with them. That's brilliant. That's, it's like really important. That's, 
Yeah, that's that's brilliant. And and it's it's not so much like you know this whole well, how do we do interdisciplinary work? Well, my my conviction is that you don't do it by deciding which disciplines you want. You do it by deciding which people you want to work with. And whatever disciplines they have, they they can bring in, but it's I mean, obviously, you know, you could maybe you need someone from a certain discipline, but the fact that they or in that discipline is not nearly as important as the, as the, whether you get on with them. Yeah. If you don't get on with them, the work's not going to really happen. I think, um, just to build on that point before we take, I think there's a couple of questions in the, in the room. Um, I mean, I wanted to talk a bit more about this informal space, right? So we obviously, um, through COVID, we, we got a really good idea of what, uh, Education's like when you strip it back to the formal education requirements. Um, and we got a really good sense, I think, or I did personally, of what we were missing out of that. Um, and I, just being back in the building, um, you know, it's a, it's a common conversation that the bar is one of the most important places in the AA. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on how, how an educational institute fosters the, this kind of mysterious, intangible, informal um, space that we're all talking about, which actually maybe becomes these spaces of co-creation that can sit alongside more formal mechanisms of evaluation, which maybe do need to be skewed towards um, the individual or not. Um, what are those, you know, how do you nurture? I mean, I'm thinking actually of your, the garden you have at ETH. I think there's a, there's a real sense that um, a, a place like the AA needs to be tended, like, a, you know, gardened and nurtured in some way. And how do you, how can a school like the AA understand or or tap into that intangible mysteriousness that we're all talking about? Um, maybe I'll have a go at that one, because I, I sort of know the AA. Mm. I mean, no, I don't really know the contemporary AA that well. I knew it some, some time ago, and I know that garden. I mean, the thing with the garden project that we do at ETH, it's usually two, two weeks per semester, so it's not mm. actually a huge amount of time. But let's say, and it's, there are various, let's say, didactic aims, which are quite specific to do with ecology and, and things like that, and to do with certain skills, certain knowledge of, let's say, what, you know, one, I would say the most fascinating, it's not even a material, it's a space, earth. Like, it's the most misunderstood substance in architecture. It's a line that's given a profile that you put things in, you know, and then um, when in fact it's kind of just alive and it's doing all sorts of really interesting stuff. And I think that we as architects don't understand it well. So that's one of the motivations. But some of the side shows are that my experience is that after a day of gardening, people are a little bit happier, which is you know, it's not, not super profound, but it makes then the crit the following day a little bit easier, you know. Mm. So it's sort of, there's a kind of social side, there's a sort of, you know, slightly maybe even a little bit hippie side to it, which is um, about spending time together, spending time outside, not trying to kind of break the kind of hermetic nature that, you know, so... The AA is this bunch of buildings. I know that there's another one over there, but psychologically, it's this stretch, right? And it's inside, except when there's a whirly thing outside. Um, you know, so it's 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 spatial. It's spatial performance is very very tightly um, prescribed, and maybe all not just the, uh, the AA, but the, we're here today. But maybe all the institutions need to learn how to be spatially more kind of liberated, more porous, more... Um, and I think that maybe that is one of the things that we did learn over the last couple of years is that we all became even more spatially constrained and we realised how, like, you know, how um, frustrating and how kind of disabling it can be. Um, 
uh, so um, yeah I, I would I would say in terms of that kind of nurturing I think it's kind of to do with sort of I suppose if you're going to extend that gardening metaphor it's to do with kind of pruning and turning the earth and kind of getting more air into it and clipping it back before, so it can come back better and all those sorts of sort of tending and um, uh, so sort of quite tough love in the end gardening I mean have you ever seen a really experienced gardener prune it's brutal it's like you know you sort of think they're going to kill the thing but in fact of course it's about its own resilience and um, so I, I, I sort of feel like maybe that's maybe as a kind of a, as an outsider observer, I sort of feel like the kind of the spatial porosity of the of the AA hasn't changed a great deal, more or less as long as I've known it, which is two three decades, and maybe now it just somehow, I think that Bedford Square and the address is fundamental, but maybe it's not the it's not the thing that has to be constantly reinforced. You know, the black door, um, you know, which if we know, we know is open. But you have to know. So it's kind of a, you know, I suppose, I suppose it becomes a really interesting architectural question, you know, like, uh, because the architecture is saying, is extremely clear about what it's saying, yet the operations inside somehow subvert that. And that's, that's maybe for the AA to kind of work out how to play that a little bit. Yeah, and then there's then there's Hook Park. Mm. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah, there's there's Hook Park, which is amazing, but it is four hours away, five hours away. It's quite away, yeah. So it's kind of again, its presence within the kind of the constellation is very. It's a real challenge to lock it in if you're not part of, if you're not already part of the game. Mm. I mean, if you know it, then it's obviously an extreme extraordinary place. We had a question from Irene in the front. Yeah. Do you have a mic, actually? <clears throat> we just need a mic. For, yeah, awesome. Thank you. OK, thanks. Um, what, I, what I'm about to say, I mean, it is, I think, related in to some degree with a number of things that have been said so far. And what strikes me is that not only all three, but all four of uh, presentation, including Marina Tabassum's uh, uh, presentation earlier, and perhaps she's still with us, are about making, making things. Now, it wouldn't have been the case in the School of Architecture 20 years ago. Uh, you know, what people would have made 20 years ago would have been maybe drawings and maybe models, but actually what people were really interested in were ideas. Um, so I'm very struck by this, and I also would like to suggest that perhaps in the four presentations that uh, were made this morning, there were maybe two... Uh, distinctive approach. One is making outside, uh, and Tom has just spoken about the uh, problem with the door of the AA, and, um, and uh, Marina uh, Tabasum also clearly has been showing work that has been done um, in, uh, with others in the landscape. And then there is another approach to making, which is perhaps represented by uh, Mark and Zoe, which is uh, making things about the laboratory and making the laboratory as uh, welcoming as can be so that people might be willing to actually enter it. Um, and to me, the question that this raises is how do we actually position education in, con in the context of broader questions and precise, uh, among others, the questions that we were raised at the outset uh, by Marina Tabassum about, for instance, climate change, but there are many other major, major, major issues which are discussed on a daily basis um, 
and um, which I suppose there is some kind of urgency for some to actually address. So the question is, you know, uh, if, that, if, it, if it is correct that there, there have been two uh, different uh, approach, one perhaps more inside, one perhaps more outside that have been put forward, then how does that um, might express itself in the way we actually frame education? Yeah, I mean, um, let's say as a as a as an outsider, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's interesting at ETH. I mean, the things I didn't present was that I was presenting work from my studio, which is and there are more than twenty five. So it's one twenty fifth, and then there are sixteen departments. So I'm one twenty fifth of one sixteenth of an enormous organisation. So, and most of which is played inside. And it's played in like scientific laboratories as well as workshops, as well as, you know, I mean, some of the workshops at ETH are extraordinary. You know, some of the, I think, I think they have the big, I think they boast like the largest uh, 3D printer in the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's the size, I mean, it's the size of a warehouse. I mean, it's, um, and lots of computational stuff, lots of that um, uh, machine learning as well as kind of parametric stuff. And that's all going on. And it's sort of amazing, but it's also not my, not my world. So you'd have to get, you know, some of those other ones to, to, to share that, that work. Um, uh, and, um, but I think that the idea of working outside is that, I mean, Marina put it very well when she put this, there was a slide up where she said this way and it was pointing in two different directions and she said, and we're all confused. And I think that that is, in a sense, that was a really kind of, I think a really fundamental thing in the, in the education. We know what the issues are, but we, we're not necessarily asking the question directly does not necessarily get you any clearer or any further. And you somehow need alibis to penetrate some of the different the different layers in which um, these questions of the kind of societal questions and the climate change questions. So you need kind of ways of being able to work very directly, um, so that you don't just grind to a halt. I mean, you know, it's very easy to get completely overwhelmed by the issues. Yet there are certain things in which I would say that the architect or the potential architect has huge agency. They just need to switch up and maybe um, explore different, certain slightly different types of knowledge which have not traditionally been within our discipline. So ones to do with certain types of ecologies, some with different types of materialities, um, including the kind of biological and the organic, as well as the kind of, I mean, we do use the, the organic and the formerly biological, you know, so timber and, and so on. But generally, it's in its most inert state. Not always, but generally. And so to get involved with real spatial situations with real weather and real climate and real people somehow helps frame the question and the way in which ideas are channeled, I would say, is just slightly different to the controlled environment of the workshop and the lab, which of course are wonderful environments, but you know, everybody's got to kind of, in a sense, pick their battle or, or their opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I think, I mean, obviously the lab is, is the, the great power of the lab is failure, the space for failure. And I think, or the space to, um, to test things without fear of failure. Um, and this, I think this space between the kind of the field and the lab is, is really interesting. But maybe it goes back to um, what Mark was saying about the interior space the architecture student and actually perhaps it's also a kind of more negotiation between that nurturing of, of the student's own creative process which has to happen 
of their own design process. Um, I mean, architectural education is, is, is hugely complex. You know, students are navigating not only how to design their own design process, navigating an incredible breadth of tools, techniques, skills um, that need to be learned. They're navigating uh, disciplinary knowledge. Um, and then I think perhaps the one that's lost sometimes is the one that we've been talking about, which is navigating collaboration and um, multidisciplinary working. Because I think that that permeability that you were talking mm. about um, also goes with a kind of permeability for the discipline itself of architecture. And I think some of the, you know, some of the issues that we face going forward can only be tackled um, by multidisciplinary um, kind of collectives. Can only be tackled through this kind of um, this kind of space that Zoe's talking about at IOM, where where knowledge from different disciplines can be used together. And I think that's one of, maybe the black door is, is a kind of perfect analogy for, for also for the architectural profession. Um, we actually have a, student, uh, a question in a text here that I just wanted to read out. Can I add in just to quickly, yeah, on the outside yeah. inside thing, is that also it's easy to think when it's outside it's public and the role of an outside but still private space is another thing on that continuum maybe that makes it difference like we're in our second space so we're not moving we're expanding the second space it's um part of ucl's campus on the olympic park that they're building and it, the outside is incredibly public in fact it's incredibly um guarded and there's lots of regulations because it's the queen elizabeth olympic park and although we're allowed to spill out we're spilling out into a regulated environment but we've built on our second floor a balcony that's a private outdoor space i mean it's not massive but it's like bigger than the ground floor of my flat you know it's a substantial balcony on a huge building that will be which I'm really excited about because that's private outdoor space and it's weirdly illicit and we're you know we'll have a view of other people like it, it's just an opportunity for something to get up to there that wouldn't be allowed to happen in the proper public mm. space mm. I think actually I think that's a super important point that in this inside and outside is that we have always placed us in public space which is one of the reasons why technologically we're pretty basic for simple pragmatic reasons, but mainly because we are generally in a, in a kind of highly exposed and therefore you have to kind of keep your, literally keep your kit to a minimum mm. and you have to then be able to respond to the kind of the social, I mean things like, you know, the thing that we did in, in the lake where we floated this structure across the lake, it was insanely public and incredibly difficult to manage just um, the kind of the, the you know connecting a portaloo on the lake of the uh, on the shore of the lake was a was a kind of public event i mean it was kind of the, the whole thing so i think that 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 definition that, that zoe makes between a kind of being able to have a a, a controlled space and private space in which essentially you can fail in private mm. versus one where your margin of failure is much more narrow. You can fail a bit, but not much in public mm. because it affects, it could affect um, other people. So I think this public-private thing is very important. I'm just going to read out this comment. Um, I think it's from Sasha, is it? Um, there's two points. A, is education about knowledge? And B, uh, Mark, I'm fascinated with what you said about educating the interior world of the student. Um, please correct if that's a misinterpretation. Then what kinds of knowledge are gained by the student by themselves versus what kind of knowledge is imparted by the educator and how does it work? How to nurture, as Kate mentioned, a student doesn't need an educator or does one? And C, can the educator help establish perspective in a world after modernity? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a pile of pancakes right there to work yeah. through. Just take one off the uh, top. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think there's only a very limited number of things that a teacher can teach. Uh, so 
first of all, this technique. The technique really matters, and you can teach technique. So, uh, so there's that. That's an, that's easy. That's easy, easy to answer, and, and essentially easy to do. Also, there's also a kind of you can a teacher can also present a kind of model, either of behavior or of demeanor, and it could be both negative or positive, you know, uh, model. So that's another thing that a teacher, a kind of other kind of teaching that's uh, invisible or ha half invisible um, as well. But most of the education, at, in I'm thinking now of architectural education or, or in the in a creative realm of some some form or another, is the job of the student. I mean, it's 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 all down to you as a student what it is you're going to learn. And uh, so the, the teacher, the, or the other role of the teacher is, it could, is the kind of enabler where you open a space uh, or you set constraints, cu cunningly set constraints or, or figure out how to open a space or provide resources, both physical and intellectual or emotional resources, or not, not emotional, but a kind of uh, atmospheric uh, resources to, to assist uh, an, a, individual students in their own uh, education. And, but this specifically has to do with, you know, creative endeavors, which are, um, there's so many things you can't teach directly. Mm, I agree. I mean, I totally agree with you with the idea of holding a space. I think that is one of the most important things that a school of architecture can do. And to kind of, maybe it's kind of laying on a, an appropriate buffet, right? And then, um, I agree, it, it's, it's really up to the student in a lot of ways. It's up to the student to take ownership of how they want to learn, how engaged they want to be with the learning. But yeah, it's a it's perhaps a framework um, that's most critical. It makes me remember being a student, and like I I think it's probably unnecessarily revealing. But like uh, I know that I wanted to impress certain people because I thought they were good, and I wanted them to think I was good. Do you know what I mean? Like, so actually, I was motivated <coughs> by wanting to impress them. Mm. And so why would I choose to want to impress some people and not other people? And what, and what was it that I... And I didn't... It wasn't going to be through a mark or something. Like, it wasn't about I wanted to do well at my course because I wanted a grade. I actually... All I want to do is let, catch that person's eye and let them think that was a good thing because they impressed me, so I wanted to impress them. And that was sort of it, I think. I think that was it. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe I just have like a just tiny thing to add to that. It's sort of maybe in the same direction. I, when I was a student, I remember having this, I mean, it's certainly not the theory, but it's kind of pub chat. Um, it's the, 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 um, my educators, and I think a better word than teachers, um, but um, came in kind of more or less two, two models, but it's actually a spectrum. There were the, the ones who taught by content, who had a really particular position and a particular field of knowledge, and they would jam it into you. And it wasn't, you know, how it went in didn't really matter. It just had to go in. And then there were teachers by charisma. And you were never entirely sure what they were teaching you. Nevertheless, time spent with them was thrilling and inspiring. And somehow they tickled your curiosity and your appetite and stuff like that. And somehow, you know, and I remember just kind of, because I'd be able to sort of, let's say, think back about, let's say, a really interesting period in the studio or in any other type of um, learning environment, and then kind of go, that was amazing. And then the friend would ask you, what did you learn? Said, I don't know, you know, but it was still amazing. Um, and, and I think that that's the sort of, I suppose that the learning and educational environment is always moving across these spectrums about, you know, actually very specific types of knowledge being 
produced and shared and being explicitly contained and autonomous. And then others just being about this kind of very um, open kind of field. Um, and I probably most educators, probably most people occupy some, are somewhere on that spectrum. I mean, it's sort of, maybe it's also kind of quite human. Yeah, it's the kind of second one is the kind of wax on wax off for fans of the Karate Kid. Um, are there any more questions in the room? Just aware of time, We've got a couple of minutes, or online? Yeah, have you? No, I uh, I'm very grateful to the four speakers really. Uh, I mean, Marina set it up that we have to, uh, that architecture and education architecture is how we help others to relate to nature, right? And I think she made it very clear, you know, this is what we have to, to resolve and, and do it. But the question comes that um, for me, uh, to work with nature is good, but it's not good enough. We are nature, we are the rational part of nature. So therefore, that curatorial um, element that you've been talking about it's only sideways, is crucial at the moment, I think. So I don't know whether you have comments on that. The second thing, I think, is that, um, Zoe, uh, you know, it was fabulous to see that um, there's a chemistry uh, in cooking, but uh, and inevitably you're looking for something together, and there's the person that comes and separates everything and wants to eat anchovies separate from the rest. And, um, <laughs> you know, if somehow it, this is... This is what we're talking with. So I'm very grateful of what, for what you said, you know. And um, with, with Tom, I think it's such a, a, a parallel to what we're actually doing in any school that actually reveals that we can be completely um, out of touch with what we should be doing because, you know, we are plugging in still what, what we were taught kind of thing. So my question for all of you is how you see... Um, that the school of architecture can actually provoke this change in, in, in the school itself. Mark? <laughs> <laughs> tag your, tag your it. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Uh, 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 maybe you could... Uh, restate the question or tell me the question again because the, you, ended, you ended with a, a question about how how the institution can change itself is that is that the, what you're getting at or not individually we've seen what we we can do and we cannot do or we must do but as an institution all of you are actually heading institutions as it were well how we can actually re phrase the question that actually moves us forward rather than continue, perhaps more aware of problems and continue doing the same thing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't have an answer to that one. I mean, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say to it, except that, you know, an institution, any collective is immensely complex. And, and oh, well, you know what? I, maybe I do have something to say about that because Leadership really matters. <laughs> it really, really matters. And and I've worked with um, some great leaders, and I've worked with some monsters. And uh, and so having the right, and also, I mean, I've only worked occasionally where there was no discernible leader, but that was only in very small groups, you know, three, four, five people, and after five. It's almost impossible to to make a collective work that's somehow horizontal. So I don't know. We're we're large apes. I, I don't know how to what it is, but you know, the leadership is key. And so the the guidance, let's say, or the or the focus of a change that is collectively desired requires. Um, something more than the collective. It requires some kind of leadership. I, I, mean, I just think that that's the case. So that's not not an answer, but it but it but but it but it um, 
it puts the finger on exactly what you are you guys are up against right now uh, I mean maybe perhaps from the perspective of the institution that I belong to um, I think that it seems like the key questions are pretty much well understood by everyone everyone who's engaged so it's not a question of convincing anyone about which way we should be facing and what questions should be tackled. But I think that maybe the thing that is different now to perhaps uh, previous times is that the um, agency or the uh, pressure to act is not coming from the top, but it's coming from the ground. It's coming from actually every generation of young people coming in are expecting, and if they're not getting it, forcing the institution to respond. And I think there is a shift in agency uh, going on at the moment, which is not dissimilar to, let's say, the conversation about evaluation, in which actually um, there is a very uh, active and demanding, you know, from the first day of first year, people are not passive anymore, waiting to be filled with a set of skills that are then marketable. They want their they are you know, they are politicized actually, you know, from way before they walk through the front door. And I think that, that the institution needs to be able to make the most of that energy, actually. And that's um, and I would say that that's kind of interesting coming from let's say one which is traditionally, I would say, ETH is, you know, an old Central European polytechnic, very hierarchical. In fact, its foundation is almost military. So um, it's, it's really, and it's very big as well. So it doesn't move maybe quite with the ease of somewhere like here. Um, and, but nevertheless, I think that it's, it, is, it is responding and it is kind of feeling both the energy and the pressure and of um, all of these things and I think that it's a question of um, I mean it's a question of leadership as Mark says but I suppose it's a que the leadership needs to um, make the most of that kind of bottom up energy which is really, is really I've been there 10 years and it's a fundamentally different place to the one I stepped into. The one I stepped into was absolutely, was it the hero architects? It was just, I mean, they were just everywhere in every corner, you know, and now most of them have retired and there's a kind of new generation which is kind of less interested in those kind of positions. So I think it's, I think it's looking, I, I would say it's looking very um, promising. Yeah, that, well, that's an interesting point. And, and, it, and it, it raises a kind of, warning about leadership and you know that i i suppose there are a lot of pyromaniacs in the fire department you know uh, so so the people who are applying for leadership positions tend to be people who like power is self-selecting or are at least comfortable with power at the very best so um it's so difficult to find a leader who whose instincts are those of generosity um but there it is, and and the so yeah. Well, I'll just leave it at that. I, I would really echo that. I think perhaps this um, we don't need the hero director either. Um, perhaps um, the this idea of co-authorship is one that threads through um, a leader um, and needs to thread through a leader. Generosity is a nice word. Um, I think actually that's a nice word to leap, to end on. Um, unless anyone else has got any comments. Thank you. Thank you. My God, I've really enjoyed this. This was great. You guys are amazing. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mark. What time is it there, Mark? Here? Yeah. So it's just past eight o'clock in the morning. Wow.
bless you. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Bre- breakfast time. <laughs> Lunch time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll leave you to go have a kip. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Nice to meet Mark and Joy and Tom and Mark. That was just... I mean, I can't sum up. It just highlights how important we individually are to start really thinking about what part, what we can, you know, our bit can be important. So it's lunchtime. And for those who are in the physically here, uh, you can get lunch from South Jury Room. And if it's, you know, if you go to tele- terrace or bar, and then we will come back at two. And for those who are online, thank you very much. Please get your own lunch. <laughs> and you can stay online, but we will start at two o'clock um, UK time with another keynote uh, from Doshi from uh, India. And then we start another roundtable discussion. Thank you. Thank you for another applause for the <laughs> panels. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Um, I am I am Irene Skelber, also on the search committee. Um, one of the person we have contacted for uh, this conference is Doshi, um, and I doubt um, some people in the room would have been here. 40 years ago, when Doshi actually last spoke at the AA. Um, and first, I would like to thank uh, Snehal Shah, who might actually be online at the moment. Snehal Shah was a student at the AA many years ago, and he very kindly uh, uh, acted as an intermediary between us and Doshi. He's a friend of Doshi, and I am a friend of Snehal Shah. Now, Sneaj have wrote a, a recent article in the um, um, Indian magazine, and uh, he called uh, Doshi a man of the Renaissance in the modern world. And I think this is a nice expression because there is a kind of uh, anachronism in um, the, uh, the expression. And by this, he also meant to indicate that Doshi was uh, somebody who has done a considerable amount of work, but also a considerable variety of different work. He has been a teacher, a scholar, he has been a planner, an architect, and particularly relevant today, he has been also a, a builder of institutions in India. And during the pandemic, apparently, he has also been a painter and a sculptor. Now, he uh, is easily the best known architect in India. He has received more prize than one would like to uh, say. Uh, The Pritzker Prize in 2018, the Aga Khan Award 2015-16, and most recently, the RIBA gold medal for which he will come in April on the 27th, I think, to receive it. Um, now, as I said, his influence in India has been really considerable. And in the first instance, uh, through uh, his built work, and there has been recently actually a marvelous book which has just come out on his work. Um, but perhaps um, almost as much, or perhaps even more so, through the creation of SEPT. SEPT uh, is uh, the School of Architecture in Ahmedabad, uh, which is in Gujarat, in the north of India. And uh, Doshi actually created the school uh, in 1962. Now, initially, it was only uh, architecture, And over the following 20 years, it was yet again Doshi who actually enlarged the school in successive phases. And he added in succession um, a planning school, a school of technology, a school of management, and last two institutes uh, for the visual arts. All this on the same campus and all this in mostly buildings which 
have been built by Doshi himself. And I had once, actually, the good fortune of uh, giving a lecture, actually a lecture about the AA uh, at SEPT. And I must say, I thought the auditorium was absolutely marvelous. Um, and as far as the approach to education uh, in uh, the, um, the school, um, Doshi has referred, and I rather like the expression, he referred to education without doors. And I like the expression because it both refers to education and to architecture. Now, uh, when we asked Doshi uh, if he would like to uh, speak uh, to us today, um, Doshi kindly agreed and um, we in turn sent him a whole raft of questions on the creation of SEPT and on what he thought the legacy of SEPT uh, was uh, and is in India. Um, and instead, um, he uh, did something quite different and he decided to just talk about the big picture. And by which I mean that he uh, spoke about what actually made him an architect and also what at his great age, he is now 94, and a very healthy 94. I had a good fortune again of meeting him two years ago in, in India. Um, and what remains to him uh, important at his age. Now, I would like also to thank uh, Kushnu uh, Pantaki Hoof, who is the granddaughter uh, of Doshi and who is now playing a key role in running Sangat, the office. And the recording you will see is actually quite short. Uh, it's about 15 minutes. And it's been recorded in Doshi's garden. And occasionally you hear Kushnu's voice and also you hear uh, the birds. Um, so, I hope you enjoy it. You know, I was born in an extended family. Grandfather and children and everybody else. About 20, 25 people together. So, I never know what was the beginning and what was the bend or what is the direction because everybody came from different places, they spoke openly and then I learned one thing from them that everything is uncertain and everything has a possibility and that I have imbibed in my life. Openness, togetherness, Constantly searching and not bothering whether you are successful or not successful. It was living life. And that even I have followed in my design. In planning, etc., I always follow that part because we are not taught to teach in timelessness. Even in office of Cordillera, it was a project, time-bound project. But when I began to start planning school and others, I realized that there is some other aspect to the whole thing, time. Timelessness, change, uncertainties and possibilities. And this I experienced in my life through a lot of upheavals in the whole family. So when I left my house, and went to join the School of Architecture in Bombay. I had no idea about this, but this was something at the back. Then I went to London, then I went around. Why did I do this? I was all the time asking this question. Uncertainty, potentials, opportunities, these things have become my base. And that is how really I even started the School of Architecture. Or I do my practice, or I have this partnership that I have with younger generation. 
of diverse views, diverse culture. Because as I grow old, I have a nice garden in the house. The garden has grown over time. And from that I learned something. Diversity, adaptability, uncertainties, but there is always life. There is always blossoming. There is always a mix. And so in my planning, in my designs of housing, everything, I use that element of uncertainty and potentials of change and giving something beyond the unexpected. And that is how my practice is. So my practice is, has the canvas of my life. Yeah. And in this canvas, you will pick up these things. Because I have seen this in Michelangelo's painting. The last paintings, you know, I saw in Italy. The whole evolution of life is there. And to me, he is always the... Because Corbusier's model was Michelangelo. And so I have imbibed him and I always look at that sense of wonder sense of joy, sense of uh, variation, but richness, uncertainty. And this has become my backdrop to all my work. So if you ask me, how did I start the school of architecture or what did I do? I just played. I thought, why not? It can also happen. It can also blossom. It can also have variations, and that is how from architecture it became planning, it became regional planning, and then it became a completely a campus of university. Otherwise, how can university be connected to an architecture? So, what I'm trying to say is, we can talk about detailed examples, but the point I'm making is, this whole idea of complexities and opportunity. And they have become the basis of my work. And if you see my work, it, why did I do Gufa? The gallery, which is completely different from a regular building of School of Architecture. And I did those because I wanted that kind of counterpoint to be remembered. And that counterpoint is very essential in our everyday life, which we don't understand. Universe, I mean, the corona has come. How do you adapt to a situation? How do you go beyond? And I think that is important, the boundaryless, the openness, becoming closer, to the natural nature phenomena. So, the natural phenomena and everything, that, that, that grows on its own. But how do you design for uncertainty? How does one, what should be the approach? You start with something else. Supposing, how does a house become a family? As somebody comes to you and say, I want a house and, you know, I'm married and I have that. But how do you know that, you know, he will have three children or two children? I mean, what is the phenomenon of India where you have extended families? When I see those extended families, houses in old Ahmedabad, and when I see the patinas of different layers of buildings happening on the whole same facade, I feel so fascinated because there I can see the the kind of impact of the younger generation, the new ideas, the styles added on, and all these variations are added. So I see this in my experience of the old city of Ahmedabad. And that is why the old city of Ahmedabad has become very rich. And that is how I admire Jaisalmer. That there is something called time, there is something called uh, place, you know, in Jaisalmer, there are large gargoyles in the desert. So I went and I was wondering, how come uh, where there is no rain, the gargoyles are the biggest, longest? So 
suddenly I realized that they were expecting uncertainties of flood, heavy flood. So what is the argument? What is the relation between the two? I think there is something called most unexpected things can happen and the word anticipation is very important. There is an anticipation if you observe nature, if you observe climate, if you observe behavioral patterns, if you observe the kind of life of people you know in the society, there is a huge amount of diversity, uncertainty, unexpectedness, and there is a richness to it. So what I like to talk about is that uncertainty, but the richness of uncertainty. And this is what I try to do with my practice. So when you look back at SEPT in retrospect, yes. what was the best thing about it and how is it adapting to the changes now? And if you had to start a new school of architecture today, what would it be like? Would it be on the same model or would you? First of all, when I decided to plan the SEPT, my first plan was very structured. But when I did the first building, then I realized that it is not correct because by that time I found it is not only architecture, it is not only habitat, but it also has planning. It also has other things. And now we have building science and technology. So over time, SEPT has got many, many disciplines which have come. There is an interior design school, there is another program. So the whole idea is and nothing is uni uh, unified or limited in scope. So SEPT has one thing that there are diversity, Kanoria Center for Arts. What has that to do with architecture in a sense? Or there is a visual art center. Or there is a Kanoria center. Then there is a gallery. Because actually, when we talk of architecture, why are we not talking about life as a whole? Life of communities as a whole. Diversities in which there are moods happen as a whole. We never talk of celebrations when we design architecture. How come? We don't talk about seasons. Everything is climatically controlled, so everything is becoming uniform. And why there is not a hierarchy of scales? And we admire old cities. We admire to go to Italy. We admire to go to say, old towns and other places. And we admire the diversity, the scales, the time, the change, that, that transformation. And how come when we teach or when we talk or when we design, we talk of restricted things? We, are, we have to reverse the order. We have to become human and we have to gradually learn that we are growing from children to old age. And there are generations with different viewpoints. So, foreseeing future is not our job. But anticipating uncertainty is our job. And that is what I try to practice. I was never trained as a teacher. Neither I had a formal education in a system. Or there is no way I can say that I learned in a theoretical way, the classical to gradually to the some kind of isms in our time. What I found was that when I go to Italy, when I go to Greece, when I go to some desert, I see a lot of things which are not there. When I went to see, I was in with Hassan Fati long back. And he had done beautiful drawings of Egypt, fantastic drawings. But they were not connected to anything, according to me. And I was puzzled, you know, I said, how come I admire, of course, Hasan Bhati, but his drawings were very different. 
they were not even Egyptian, they were mix of things. Then I began to look at the Egyptian drawings and then I saw classical drawings, European drawings. Then I wonder, how come the grace, the timelessness, of course it is in everything, but I am admiring the Egyptian, there is silence. And that silence has been my haunting. There is this silence, there is steadiness, and there is a meaning of timelessness. It's not active. When I remembered Baroque, no? when I remembered Sadalio, Apalladio, I remembered all this and I always liked, but then when I see the Egyptian hieroglyphy and those walls and those uh, carvings on those, I wonder. There is such a wonderful silence in those doors. Stillness and unbelievable grace. I have not seen any of it. doesn't mean that I don't like the other. I mean, Michelangelo and others are great, fantastic. But in that, there is that restlessness, slight restlessness. Maybe it is amusing. Maybe it is romantic. Maybe it is a gesture of life. But here, when I sit, and watch the hydrography. I think, my God, how come they descend so slowly and they will always stay? For me, restlessness is not nervousness. Hmm. Restlessness is introducing or getting towards activities which are unanticipated. They can be joyous, they can have another mood, but the whole idea of the mind is the soul, according to me, wants that glimpse the most unexpected. That's all. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, with his wisdom, I think we all feel our frame of mind. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> our frame of mind is expanded, and it's an amazing occasion again uh, to hand over to the our afternoon panel. Uh, so I hand over to two students who will be chairing, Aidan and Denise. And then it's up over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. So, yeah. Uh, welcome all back. Um, it was a really exciting morning with lots of interesting discussions and we're sure this afternoon session will follow in a similar manner. Yeah. Uh, so first up, we would like to introduce Sapake and Guillaume, and I'd let Dennis do her bio. So Sapake is a curator and educator who's also currently the creative director of Institute of International uh, Visual Arts in London. And she's somehow familiar with the AA because she gave a lecture last March about actually her project that she initiated during her po position as head of education in Documenta 14. And the project is called um, Under the Mango Tree, which is a self-organized gathering of unlearning practices. And her work is a very uh, poetic critique of today's socio-political rules, which challenges set ways of learning and teaching and also thinking. So. I leave the platform to you. I, if I speak in between, uh, or should I speak into? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> into this one? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. 
Um, I, uh, in preparation um, of thinking about uh, today's session, um, I wanted to think about um, the idea of uh, the kitchen potentially being a place which might um, transform our thinking about institutions. Um, you might think, why the kitchen? Um, so this was the beginning of my thoughts as well. Why the kitchen? Um, I was um, invited, uh, and excuse me if I get the years wrong, because I think, did the architecture biennial happen last year or was it the year before? Last, last year, yeah. We've lost all sense of time, <laughs> but that's maybe okay. Um, so I was invited to, um, uh, to, to write about something for the uh, Russian pavilion um, uh, and I was f for the architecture biennial and I was also writing at the time uh, for the for the catalogue as well and there was these notions of coming together and thinking about what it means to come together but in this time when we were thinking about coming together we were in isolation so <laughs> I really struggled actually uh, to think about what are these spaces of coming together? Um, what is the spatial quality that you're trying to produce or you're trying to create? Um, and I often think through forms of pedagogy as well. So at the time as well, when I was giving lectures and talks, mostly online, um, uh, I was asked the question, oh, you, you're talking about the aesthetics of togetherness and what that looks like, but what does it look like in a digital sphere? And I really didn't have an answer for that. Um, I always talked about the importance of intimacy in creating spaces, especially in uh, producing new forms of knowledge, but what did it look like in the digital sphere? I didn't have an answer for that. So I've been spending the last two years you know, trying to overcome that in various ways. Um, and one of those ways was through reading. So um, I'm going to read um, to you a text that um, has maybe, yeah, has started to help me think through the kitchen. So think through spatially what are the qualities of the kitchen and why I believe that within the kitchen um, it possesses the tools for us to reimagine and rethink our institutions. Um, but I have to say, this is an experiment, so maybe we don't find the answers in this, uh, this afternoon's talks as well. So it's just to stir up some thinking. Okay, so um, I'm going to read from this book, um, An Education, which is what we produced after Documenta 14. One of the um, projects and programs we had um, running over the course of... Um, two years was to think about the artist dinner not as something that you prepare for the artist but something that the artist prepares so what is the what are the kinds of knowledges which are unearthed in um, preparing and cooking for others um, this was a project with um, Nathan Pohio and um, Natalie Caratiana um, and the Mata Aho Collective Hangi is a traditional Maori word for food cooked in an earth oven. The process takes about seven hours in total, from lighting the fire to serving the kai, the food. In this case, all meals are cooked separately so that the vegetarian meals are kept free of meaty interference. A discussion on how a hungi is prepared and cooked, as well as some of the tikanga, traditions around hungi pre preparation and the kaupapa, Maori processes fit for purpose will follow. Delicious, healthy, and mindful goodness for all. We'll need a small crew to prepare the food and another to handle the pit, digging and fire lighting, watching, etc. The digging team needs to tap in and out of watching the fire in the early hours, dig up and um, dig up the food and to bring it to the serving tables from which the kitchen crew serve. At the end, the whole team cleans up and has a cuppa or drink together before resting. There's no gender split here. Anyone who wants to do something um, is welcome and encouraged. Everybody has their own preference for how the hangi gets done. Depending on where we make it, people can determine the kaupapa and the tikanga, the procedures and guidelines for handling food. Everybody's different. There's some 
general ways in which we th things are done, but you have to allow for each um, gathering or assembly to have its own protocol, its cower, and what's important to them under the circumstances. This situation can sometimes dictate the tikanga, what happens on the spur of the moment and how things pan out. The tikanga observes the kawa. Today we decided to cook the food in these small portions and that's a tikanga. But the kawa of keeping the food clean and edible remains the same. The soil type alone can make a difference, so too the weather, the timing, who's available, resources. You've got to be practical, but over and above everything else, everyone tries to keep the kawa as best they can. There is always someone on site who makes decisions and stays near the fire. So when I read this text, I was really thinking about um, these different protocols, these different procedures, but also the way in which um, it was not a solo endeavor. And so recognizing um, the importance of an education institution to keep the fire going. What does that mean in terms of architectural practice? What does it mean to keep the fire going? Um, what does that mean in terms of architectural discourse and discussion? How do you stay relevant as an organization? Um, I think the other things I was really um, struck by um, were, you know, what is, when we talk about keeping the fire going, what is the heart of this institution? So when I think about um, the kitchen, I often think about it as the, the heart of the home, um, of, a, of a domestic environment. Um, but I also think of it as the, the, the place in which people come together during parties. In those like social moments, um, in a gathering in a house party, you often find that, that something's really going off in the kitchen. So what is it about the kitchen that kind of creates this um, spontaneity, this spark? Um, and actually, how does an institution, um, an, a learning institution, an education institution, um, prepare for spontaneity. It's actually quite interesting just in terms of you know, what we were just listening to in terms of thinking about uncertainty. I think spontaneity is equally important. There is obviously the planned, there's the curriculum, there are the, the things that you plan and intend to do, but um, how do we plan for the unplanned? <laughs> um, which I, you know, I think is, is just something to maybe think through. Um, and so, and that's this bit where it says what happens on the spur of the moment and how things pan out, but also um, thinking through um, the protocols, what's important to be understood within each circumstance. So how does an institution respond to the social, political, and environment con environmental conditions um, that it's faced within? How does an institution meet the challenges in time um, and, and, and is seen to be relevant? So, um, there was like two other things maybe I wanted to maybe address or pick up uh, or look at um, and um, I will leave the books for anyone who's here who's interested to have a look at. Um, so that project um, was with my colleague Claire Butcher and um, as I mentioned um, this notion of like nourishing knowledge was also thinking about how maybe the haptic produces other forms of knowledge so while your hands are busy doing something what is the kind of conversation or knowledge that is produced um, and potentially um, creates uh, a dialogue or discourse which is unplanned, perhaps. Um, I don't know if, uh, if any of you attended the Istanbul Biennial, um, a, school, um, a school of schools, um, but I was really, I've been really um, interested in the way in which I think specifically the art world, but it's also interesting that it comes into the question of design as well, have been really... Um, obsessed with the idea of school as a kind of format, not only as a, a curatorial format, but also as, a, um, uh, as an artistic practice. So thinking about the form of the school as a space um, that not only uh, produces knowledge, but has a kind of aesthetic quality. Um, and I was really, uh, when I went to, um, to Istanbul to this biennial, I remember thinking it's very difficult still to escape the tropes of exhibition. Like, um, so uh, what I mean by that is that, you know, if you design for a school, um, it can't look like an exhibition, right? So if, if you're designing for a school, what does that mean? What are those structures? What are those infrastructures that you're putting in place? 
So even if I look at this room and the way that it's laid out, it determines a certain kind of interaction between us. Um, I have the, spe the, the microphone pointing towards me, that means I have to say something. <laughs> um, all of your chairs are pointing towards me, which means that, you know, I'm, you know you're, hopefully you're listening to what I have to say. So, um, you know, what are the formats that we need to think through? And I don't mean that just in terms of physical formats. I also mean that in terms of uh, formats of care, uh, formats that also engender um, trust and true exchange. I'm really interested in how you might be able to disrupt the hierarchies of knowledge. So um, when we think about the word education, it pertains to the idea of um, drawing out and leading forth. So there is this notion that there is something that exists within all of us that needs to be drawn out. And I think I like this the second notion of leading forth because it even maybe has this notion of even the, the teacher or the person who was um, drawing out their ideas being almost overtaken and the student almost leading um, in, um, in, the, in new areas of thinking about um, uh, uh, learning, um, self-learning, but also collective learning as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to maybe point to was, um, I mean, I brought, oh, I brought maybe too many things. No, yeah, it's always the case. It's like a small library in my bag, um, just in case I get bored. Um, but uh, was this book by Stephen Woolitz, who's an artist, and um, who's always, like, his questions always really strike me. But the, the reason why I really wanted to bring Stephen Woolitz maybe into the picture, into the frame, was um, in this book, um, Beyond the Plan, which I don't know, some of you may know, um, you know, he really... Uh, kind of investigates or interrogates um, the spatial relation that residents have with um, uh, with their own um, with their own maybe uh, inner architectures meaning like how do they imagine space and how do they how do they inhabit that space what is the space in which they um, try to create through whatever kind of objects or um, interiors that they produce um, but it's something that I feel we need to make sure that we include in the collective imagination of what it means to be an architect is that thinking beyond the, the cutting of the ribbon, uh, you know, the, the moment of saying, oh, my job is done as an architect, I can walk away. Um, what, is, what are those social architectures that um, are being designed? Who are they being designed for? And um, how, how, are those that are, inhabit those spaces, how do they um, contribute to that conversation? So seeing, let's say, architecture um, more as obviously a lens, a, a way of thinking, of contributing expertise and knowledge, but also seeing it very much as part of an ecology of thinking about architecture as opposed to a kind of author, which we see very much also in art, you know, the notion of a curator having like the idea, the vision, but um, how do we create um, a kind of polyphonic um, space or, or, or space for polyphonic design? Um, I'm going to leave it there because otherwise I, I think, yeah, I go on too long. But I will leave the books for anyone who wants to have a look. Uh, thank you, Sapaki. That was really beautiful and interesting. And I think this idea of Togetherness is something we're definitely all missing at the AA and very eager to get back as soon as possible. Um, so our next speaker is Lydia Gasparoni, uh, joining us online. Lydia has a PhD in philosophy and is a research and a teaching associate at the Department of Architectural Theory at the in Institute of Architecture at the Technical University in Berlin. She teaches architectural theory and philosophy with a focus on media philosophy, anthrop anthropocene theories, and aesthetics. Uh, welcome, Lydia. Uh, welcome to your hall. I'm really honored and also happy to be here today to have the opportunity to share also some reflection from Berlin and to have, of course, the opportunity to discuss with you later. I, uh, let me share my screen. Just one moment. I think that now you are also seeing my presentation. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, many thanks. I'm um, really happy to be here. 
And uh, today I decided to address the topic of modes of transformation. And I'm also very happy that I have the opportunity to uh, be in this group uh, to uh, hear the words of uh, Sepaka now, because I think that uh, I like to address the question of modes, because I think we have to uh, focus much more on new forms of pragmatics new form of acting, new form of attitudes, and really focuses on modes and not just on a new form maybe of uh, pragmatism, trying to find solution for, uh, I think, a topic that we discussed also today morning concerning the climate urgency and also the climate change. In this sense, I'd like today to firstly introduce what I mean in general um, with modes of transformation. And then I'd like to approach very briefly, of course, three different dimensions or maybe three different fields that I think will play a crucial role in the architectural education. And that is sites, media and effects. And I think there are also three important fields of the education of architecture today. I'm a philosopher. I'm, a, I think, not an outsider, but more a kind of border crosser. And in this sense, I'm really interested to um, in analyzing architecture in also collecting practices and developing new form of reflection of architecture. For me, it's very important as philosopher to unfold and develop in architecture a kind of space also with students of possibility, trying to really introduce new spaces of reflection and then also reflecting together on education and reflecting together on architecture uh, through different um, teaching experiments. Today, and I think it was uh, also a very important topic of um, the reflection of today morning, we are confronting with a kind of, I would say, vibrant energy in the realm of not just architecture, but also transdisciplinary reflection concerning the introduction of environmental models. We are now really confronted with new modes of relationality I try to define a new relationship between human and environments. And this kind of vibrant energy, that's um, maybe somebody could also understood, uh, understand uh, the sort of crisis of uh, this relationship to the environments and also of the architectural design. I think it's really important that have the potential also of transforming and generating new knowledge in architecture. If you want, we could say that these environmental model, models are, sorry, are substituting some models of appropriation that was in, that were in a sense really dualistic and hierarchical. There was really hierarchical structure of the relationship between of the relationship of between human and environments. And now we are confronted with new environmental models, then trying to find a new way, a new dynamic way also to relate human forces and also the human geological forces to the environments, trying to really, um, in a sense, find new ways, new attitude to understand uh, the transformation, not just focus on products, but really trying to understand the metamorphosis, the processes that are um, crucial understanding the way architecture can also achieve a very specific impact on her. And the thing also today morning, we have the opportunity to really focus on processes also concerning the way we are um, producing uh, material knowledge. And for the architectural design, the introduction of models is also kind of critical force. Dealing with the architecture as a transformative act, not just of the built environment, but also of the environments. So as a really creative force of constituting the environments and also of finding new forms of relating environments and also finding new forms of understanding, grasping, multi-species and forms of cohabitation. And I think that this, this kind of environmental models are really a kind of new energy for the architectural practices. But there is, of course, a lot to do. And that is also the reason why I think that education can play a very crucial role in this realm because it's motivating also us to reflect in a very specific way the effects and the impacts of our practice and also of our teaching practices, really confronting us with the problem of transformation, dealing with very specific effects. And that is the reason why I 
launched together with few stations this platform that is open to everyone. And that is maybe a kind of platform that is not academic, but is of course addressing many teaching experiences at different universities. And the idea is to really build a kind of educational platform that is able to rethink the idea of emerging practices. Emerging practices are very often um, experimental practices at different institutions, but emerging practices are very often also isolated. And the idea of this platform is really to collect, to build a network. And this network is aiming to really collect different experiments, different approaches to uh, architectural teaching pedagogy, but really trying to reveal new approaches, starting from environmental models, starting, starting also from the idea of the Anthropocene and related concepts in this realm, to really uh, try to reflect together on the transformative potential of architectural pedagogy, really putting the education in the focus, motivating teachers to explain the effects of architectural education and trying really to define in a very precise way um, the reason of um, many different emerging practices. And also students are really welcome to formulate some questions. And please feel free to contact us to participate. I hope also that AHA will uh, become in a sense also a note of this experience and then of course uh, to find new form of um, working together in a community of emerging practices. In my work as research and teaching um, associate at the Katrinfa University in Berlin, I really focus my work on three different dimensions and fields that I think are really central in the education, in the architectural education today. And in this sense, I'm a philosopher. I'm also, if you want, a kind of collector agent of practices and try also to reveal some fields that I think are really important in architectural education. In this sense, I'm now sharing a kind of knowledge that is also a field of practice that I share with many different researchers and I'm very grateful also for this opportunity. The first topic concerned for me this site. I think that the site is and will be the site sensitivity, a very important topic that also played a role to, in the discussion today morning. Science sensitivity means to learn and to introduce a new way of understanding sites of persistence, really changing and finding a new kind of paradigm shift concerning site. Sites are not just to be analyzed in order to adapt sites to architecture, but the interesting challenge is to understand how architecture will, uh, will analyze sites and generating art knowledge and architectural knowledge starting from the site. And for this reason, I think that we need also in teaching practices, new ways of really grasping the territory, grasping sites, and finding also new ways and new attitudes to the sites to apply and adapting new media and also media of the architectural design, extending the boundaries of media practices for revealing the richness of the site and starting with the media and starting with the capacity of imagine also spaces through media and architectural media to find new ways of conceiving architecture. That is the reason why in my teaching practice, the concept of media agency plays a very central, a very crucial role. In my work, I try to really understand, also inspired by the very, I think, clear sentence of John Dewey that not all means are media. I try to introduce in architecture a kind of not instrumental approach to media and really motivate students to think through media, to adapt also media that they uh, approach in architectural design to extend the semantic boundary of architecture. And that is not so easy. So I'm also struggle, I think, and I'm also struggling together with the students to adapt this real on mediality to architecture and to analysis of sites or to the analysis of very complex dimension of our society and culture to really understand that architecture can also embed these dimensions and also find new ways and new spaces of imagination trying to invent this knowledge and finding 
also new forms of adapting and transforming knowledge. That is also the sense of this works, uh, work on experimental diagrams in architecture, in which I try to collect practices and experimental diagrammatic practices. They are showing that the diagram could play also a very important role in analyzing the site, in analyzing the landscape. And the diagram is in this book also, through many different practices, motivating to rethink the way we are constructing images, and the way we are also perceiving images, not just as the media of producing affects and emotions, but also through media that are able to produce very specific effects. And then I motivated also students to rethink scale, to rethink the clash of scales, to rethink the relationships between different uh, fields of knowledge and perception, for example, of the city, of the landscape, of the territory, and also of the architectural form. And the, the, the last field, and then also conclude with this uh, last dimension that I think is really important in architecture, is really to uh, rethink the role of the effects, to document the effects, to rethink also the importance of the impact of architectural knowledge, trying to find a way in architecture to analyze the effects and the impact that architecture is generating, adapting also, again, media to find new, also new way of rethinking really important topics of architecture, for example, in this case, concerning the role of cement. And they motivate students to really dream through the media, through this kind of mediality, open up new uh, dimensions of reflection. And in this sense, at the end, I think that the big challenge will be also to um, not just introducing environmental models, but find new way of architectural design through science, media, and critical effects. But I think that today we are also approaching in our discussion many other topics to really make architectural design also as an integral part, as a kind of vibrant energy of environmental model. I think in this sense, it will be really interesting now to rethink the potential of architecture as an environmental model, also able to bring energy and to bring energy to new transformations concerning attitude, concerning a kind of pragmatics of life, and also um, dreaming, opening up new scenarios. And I think that for this reason, the philosophy also as a kind of applied discipline uh, could play a very crucial role in introducing and rethinking modes of transformation. Many thanks for this um, possibility to share this reflection. Thank you, Lydia, for your presentation. Um, now we have Evelisa Palkonen, who is a professor assistant dean at Yale School of Architecture. Uh, where she teaches design and history and theory. Her scholarly work deals with the genesis and meaning of form in various geographic and historical contexts. She's an author of many publications, including the prize-winning Alvar Aalto, Architecture, Modernity and Geopolitics, and who has also previously lectured in the AA about it. So welcome back. And yeah. Oh, uh, thank you so much for having me and uh, I really enjoyed the previous talks. I couldn't be there in the morning. Uh, I'm giving the talk from across the Atlantic, but let me uh, share my screen. So I entitled my talk, uh, Atmospheres and Encounters, because um, I firmly uh, believe that one of the most important tasks for me as an educator is to uh, create an atmosphere conducive to learning. Um, I see that organizing a successful educational event, be it a studio, seminar, symposium, is akin to hosting a party, a dinner party perhaps, uh, uh, where everybody feels invigorated uh, by human encounters and interactions. Uh, as we have probably learned, all of us, during these past two years, that uh, something gets lost when we are unable to share the same space with our, with, with our students and colleagues. Uh, it is impossible to create atmosphere via Zoom. 
and I can attest that I would much rather be with all of you in London than uh, delivering this talk uh, via Zoom uh, from my study in New Haven. Um, I guess one could uh, uh, also um, draw the conclusion that the mark of a good uh, director or dean of an educational institution is to facilitate meaningful and memorable human encounters. Uh, of course, AA's legendary director, Alvin Boyarsky, comes to mind. Uh, he has come down uh, to history as somebody who had a knack for creating synergies between people, foster debates and host exhibitions and other events. Uh, I myself remember making a pilgrimage, a desperate pilgrimage uh, to the bar at the AA in the mid 80s, uh, hoping to rub off some of that great atmosphere uh, 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 during that visit. Uh, so my task, I think, in this uh, uh, event is to give a, a history lesson. And uh, I thought uh, that we could well use the three, perhaps the most famous uh, art educational institutions of the 20th century, Butemas, uh, Bauhaus, and the Black Mountain College, um, um, as sites um, you know, where these productive encounters took place and, and maybe a proof that uh, that individual creativity that they fostered uh, uh, was nestled uh, and born out of uh, these social relationships. Um, so starting with the Vutemas, uh, um, it was famous for um, fostering a kind of laboratory setting for, uh, for um, uh, teaching and doing. Uh, the goal was to foster collaboration and interdisciplinary exchange and collaboration. Uh, photographs, uh, for example, of the famous uh, space studio uh, taught by Nicholas Ladovsky convey also the attention uh, to giving assignments that mediated between uniformity and variety. So there was something about the collective enterprise. Everybody did the same assignment, but uh, slightly differently. Uh, so fostering that sort of collective intelligence uh, um, was uh, key to the educational principle. Um, it's also interesting to note that the, uh, the kind of idea of uniform, having a uniform was very important part of this, uh, this um, sense of fostering the collective enterprise. Uh, so when, for example, Stepanova, uh, the famous uh, teacher of uh, textile design, they are created clothes she knew that she was also creating identities, including gender identity. Uh, here you can see him uh, with her husband, Alexander Rochenko, wearing what I think is the first, uh, uh, to my knowledge, is the first unisex uh, uniform. Uh, also Varvana Stepanova sport uniforms uh, and theater costumes uh, um, had a sense of choreographing bodies. Uh, into these sort of visual collective units. Uh, and it is interesting to think that the collective was also a kind of a choreographed uh, uh, aesthetic project. Uh, so continuing the history lessons, of course, Bauhaus uh, also has come down to history as a place uh, where human uh, interaction was celebrated. It was a meeting point uh, of the international avant-garde, uh, Vasily Kandinsky, Poli, Lizinski, Piet Mondrian, you know, from different countries across the continent, where just some of the established uh, household, now household names, uh, that Walter Kropius, the director, summoned to Dessau. Uh, and it is important that being part of that team, being part of the collective, uh, was uh, for many of them a turning point in their careers. And uh, to note that uh, um, 
that um, you know they that like like at Butemas the workshop setting uh, was crucial for fostering a, a kind of solidarity and uh, creativity between students who of course many of them uh, became future leaders of their own right. Uh, on the left, you see a picture of the female students at the Beaving uh, workshop. Anne Albers being somewhere there in the, on the left. Uh, of course, Bauhaus was famous for the parties uh, um, where costumes and props of all sorts played a ma uh, major role in fostering a uh, sense of uh, community. I love the picture on the right, uh, where the costume makes two, three people into a single unit. Uh, a sign of the, on the left image, Achtung Schule, uh, beware school, uh, uh, you know, provokes uh, and, uh, and uh, conveys uh, a sense that the students very well know, knew that they were not attending a standard educational institution. Uh, Luke's finding is uh, wonderful photographs um, of the life at Bauhaus uh, convey the spirited energy uh, bodies in space uh, demonstrate how the building itself helped channel and choreograph human movement. My third example uh, comes from the US, the Black Mountain College. Uh, which replicated much of Bauhaus's communal spirit uh, in a very bucolic setting. Uh, so also here the period photographs depict uh, uh, the life or helped us uh, envision and imagine what the life in the school was like. Uh, we see couples dancing, waltzing on the porch, uh, playing music. Uh, we see student dancers frolicking in the, on the grounds, uh, working in the communal garden. And despite of its uh, rather remote uh, location, a lot of uh, big names at the time uh, were eager to uh, go there and teach uh, and be part of that, uh, that, uh, that community, that uh, atmosphere. Uh, and we can well uh, even see uh, Buckminster, the dome that Buckminster Fuller uh, constructed uh, with the students as a, as a kind of emblem and a, uh, and a demonstration of that communal spirit, how those members uh, um, work in concert to create, uh, create a structure. Um, a key figure uh, at the two latter schools was uh, Joseph Albers, who taught that uh, Bauhaus uh, actually was the longest lasting teacher to my knowledge at Bauhaus. He taught from 22 to 23, uh, when he with, together with his wife, Annie, Albers uh, emigrated to the U.S. to take a job as a director of the of the Black Mountain College. Um, he uh, can be credited for introducing something that we take now for granted to architectural education, art education, namely uh, the kind of group uh, uh, crit group discussion section. And here we see him on the left. Uh, uh, conducting uh, such a conversation, all the student work. It's actually interesting in the light of the previous uh, uh, talks that this uh, re rethinking even the spatial format of how uh, teaching occurs is, uh, is interesting 
to consider, and here he is, uh, uh, not, uh, 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 not separated from students, but kind of engaging with them on kind of equal footing uh, in discussion about the work. The student work is all gathered uh, together on the floor in front of them. Similarly, on the right, we see him uh, at teaching at the Black Mountain College with a similar kind of engagement uh, uh, to teach, uh, to, to communicate, to converse with the students on a kind of equal, uh, equal footing. Uh, also telling that he is not uh, standing up. He's, uh, sometimes we see him occasionally even crawling in front of the students, uh, engaging uh, with, the, with the work. Uh, Albers famously stated in uh, 34, uh, one year into his teaching uh, directorship uh, at the Black Mountain College, uh, in an article, he wrote an article called Concerning Art Education, where he states, uh, quote, life is more important than school, the student and the learning more important than the teacher and the teaching. More lasting than having heard and read is to have been seen and experienced. Um, he actually also continued to say that it's the less you teach, <laughs> the better teacher you are. Uh, he really emphasized that the learning has to come from, from within. Uh, we have some further images that uh, really, um, I think, attest to this uh, very uh, wonderful sense of uh, engaging the students uh, in conversation, not teaching down, maybe not teaching at all, but uh, engaging students in that sort of discovery uh, and seeing. Uh, he completed his teaching uh, actually at Yale. Uh, uh, he came to Yale at 1950 uh, to take also a directorship uh, uh, in, a, in a department. Uh, and um, and launched there uh, careers of many uh, American seminal American figures, including Eva Hesse, here depicted with him uh, in the fifties, and uh, Robert Rauschenberg, uh, among uh, many others. Uh, so, uh, with this history lesson in mind, it's inter interesting to ask. Uh, also, what was uh, at stake uh, uh, in this institution? What, uh, why, uh, why? Uh, uh, clearly, something more than just having a fun, fun or having a party was at stake. Uh, and I think answer to that can be found in uh, um, John Dewey's uh, book, uh, "Democracy and Education." Uh, it was widely read at the time, uh, really revolutionized not only art teaching, but also uh, teaching in, um, in America, the kind of progressive education movement was really uh, launched by Dewey in the 19 teens, uh, very influential even today. Uh, what is interesting about Dewey's book that he attested uh, that education uh, should allow students uh, quote, to achieve the breadth and richness of experience. Uh, breadth and richness of experience. And that's why art ed education was for him important. He uh, really believed that art education should be part of everybody's education from early on. And he believed that this uh, also well-rounded curriculum, uh, well-rounded curriculum could lead uh, to emotionally an intellectually attuned public. And he believed that in turn, that well emotionally and intellectually attuned public would down the road translate into a well-balanced society. Uh, so what I draw from this is the idea that when we educate architects, we don't really educate only architects, uh, professional architects, uh, but ultimately we uh, educate uh, citizens, um, 
uh, down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, so now Dennis and I will ask a few questions just to get the conversation rolling. Um, we hope these are more broad questions that you all can jump in on, and then maybe we'll take a few from the audience. Uh, so first of all, I want to touch on this idea of togetherness and openness, which I think was a common theme throughout the presentations. It uh, feels certainly from the uncertainty of the past two years this is a moment to strip back and rebuild or transform the institute or even the idea of what an institute is. So I wanted to ask, what should the role of an architectural institute be today? And how can we re rebuild it in a way that is more open and inclusive? Um, what are the modes of education which can foster this togetherness and collaboration? And does there need to be a rethinking of the current format of architectural education? It's a big question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Was that anyone in particular? Uh, any three of you could answer this. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> Too loaded, maybe. I don't. I. I mean, I don't know if I may may start. I. I really. Um, it was a great opportunity. I think to um, uh, to um, to uh, for you to to make us all convene today and uh, I really hope that after I think this zooming has in a way been a <laughs> been a kind of a lesson for all of us that this is clearly not what education is about education is not just delivering information you know and I think zoom does a very good job I think we all feel like you can kind of do your job, you can convey the information, you can lecture, all that um, via Zoom. But then, you know, what is that something that is missing? And I think we are all now kind of suddenly realizing that education is much more than information. And, uh, and I hope that we can restructure some of the formats. I don't know, I just feel increasingly, I don't want to go to the classroom and do the same seminar, <laughs> do the same survey conduct reviews in the same way that there is a kind of a uh, kind of institutional uh, formatting that needs to hopefully I hope will change uh, because of this awareness that we are not just like uh, uh, individuals but it's something very special when we get into a same space and we should celebrate as such uh, and those formats might uh, want to change I love the Sebakes <laughs> provocation of the kitchen, uh, and uh, I don't know. Maybe we should build kitchens in the schools, uh, uh, what have you, whatever it takes. But I think we have we are all aware that there is something uh, that uh, this is an opportunity for change. Yeah, maybe to follow on from that, um, I think. Um, definitely what I feel has potentially been learned in these two years of um, of isolated learning is recognising the benefit of of the collective experiment of education so um, um, really sort of thinking about how you utilise the togetherness so um, what are the things that you can do together in terms of um, pedagogy that you cannot do on your own. Um, I also feel as if the benefit there is not only just thinking about inside the classroom or the lecture hall, but there are these other spaces in which you can occupy and think from, um, whether that's inside, um, you know, situated inside the building or outside. I think something that was also just mentioned earlier was about sightedness. So, you know, what does it mean maybe then to take um, a seminar or lecture in an area which is being rapidly regenerated, for example, or an area which has, um, yeah, suffered ongoing deprivation? What are the conversations that might shape 
the thinking and the learning um, in occupied spaces. Um, so not to uh, the fact that we have been isolated and, and have had to work from these domestic spaces. Maybe the reason why the kitchen comes up so much in my mind is because I was constantly going to the kitchen uh, during the lockdown, opening the fridge, closing the fridge, <laughs> coming out of the kitchen back to the computer. You know, it's like you have this, you have this, I would love to have seen maybe a camera of the plan of what I did, you know, during this time. How did, how did I generate um, thoughts or ideas? And so um, I also feel that there's this opportunity um, and, I, and this is another way of when I think about the kitchen of like when you do the kind of cleaning up and the clearing up to start again, there's a process of maybe evaluating, was that a good meal? Was it enjoyed? Um, what would I do differently? So not to just discard um, the previous models that we've worked with, but what are some of the things that we want to take with us and what are the new things that we want to build together? Um, to kind of elaborate on that question, when like the co when the conversation began with the kitchen and when we started talking about the Bauhaus and the parties, the common thread for me is the rituals that mm -hmm. we kind of apply to our life, mm -hmm. and how this ri like the application of these rituals create a community and the togetherness that we've been talking about at the end. And um, I think the main thing that has changed was we used to have a collective agenda, whereas now we all have our individual Zoom calls and agendas, which makes it harder to create like larger um, rituals, let's say. But I think it's quite an interesting panel in a sense that everyone on this panel comes from an educational background, but the scales of these institutions are completely different than each other. So I would like to ask kind of how this like the change in scale plays a role in terms of creating rituals and being able to apply them in today's context, whereas I said it's completely individual and not too communal anymore. Yeah, maybe I can say something concerning this point. So because also concerning the, uh, the pandemic, I think it was um, an issue really interesting to rethink uh, from a critical perspective the presence. So my experience, for example, through the use of digital media or, for example, through uh, Zoom was to really be able to um, address urgency in the here and now, beyond funding, beyond also projecting in the future. So it was really also easier to um, articulate a space of exchange in the presence, even if, and that is maybe a paradox, we were not in the same room, but it was easier to also articulate discussions together and also to open up spaces of discussion. And it was really for me a kind of new ecology of presence that, of course, I'm now also reflecting with the possibility to really unfold uh, specific spaces of presence also in real time and uh, space through teaching. But for me, it was also really interesting to articulate places of urgency in here and now. For example, also this initiative was, uh, was in a sense a short time project. And it was so uh, interesting also to build this kind of platform. Mm -hmm. I actually have a specific question for you to Lydia. Uh, uh, when you were talking about site sensitivity, because in the morning lectures as well, there was a reference to standardization versus locality, where when we look at when we look at the history and the glorified history of architecture, it's mostly based on standardization and modernity, whereas now I think we're evolving to a phase that we figure out it's not working well when you try to apply the same thing in multiple locations. Mm. So I was just wondering which one translates better today and if you could ever like create some sort of standardization through locality in its own or if it could kind of inform each other in a way or are we still asking this or that kind of question? Mm. I think that uh, for me the problem also in education concerning this question um, um, concerns also the, the media, 
because there is a kind of standardization in the way we are using also architectural media, for example, as tool of representations. And when I um, try to extend also the knowledge of sites and of course of the diversity of sites, then I try to motivate students to extend also the agency of media to other realms. And that is not easy. That is really something that we have in a sense to change. So learning, learning also to understand and grasp media and media, of course, not just as uh, digital tools, but really also media also concerning our embodied experience, concerning different ways that we have to sense and perceive all the realities, to adapt this media also to embed other semantic dimension. That, and my experience in teaching is that, of course, very often this critical spaces are present, reflecting, for example, uh, concerning sites, concerning city, concerning different forms uh, of different also territories. But it's not so easy to find a kind of form of analysis of these places and finding also a form of visibility for these places. And this um, form of visibility are, of course, also common fields of perception in which we can also find a kind of exchanging and also trying to find a new space of negotiation concerning the site. In this sense, I think that we have also reflect on the standardization on media and media. Mm -hmm. Because I, even if I'm a philosopher, I like to motivate students to be architects and not philosophers. Not just to reflect or think, but also trying to think through architectural media and through spatial capacity of perceiving a different and the, sorry, the diversity of territories. Because I think it also applies to something you said, Sepake, about the tension between the intention of the architect and also the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And how I think like one of the main problematics that comes with standardization is it fully is backed by this idea of the architect applying something somewhere without really thinking about the context of it. So um, I just wanted to ask, like, how do you think this tension between the expectation and the reality relate to the way we learn and teach today in architecture specifically? Mm. I mean, I was just thinking through the idea of, um, you know, obviously architecture always employs this idea of the model, but how, how can the model be um, adapted? How is it adaptable? Uh, meaning... Um, uh, what are the what are the kinds of uh, forms of design that allows for um, you know these questions that actually we raised earlier about seasonality about change time mm -hmm. how does architecture how do you how can you conceive of a design that changes over time that is not um, also just we're so um, uh, hardwired for the visual, right? So the, the hot Instagram image, mm -hmm. but that's really, for me, it's relating a, a flatness. It doesn't tell me anything about the textual quality, the sensual quality, the sensing, um, the, what, how, how does the building sound? You know, what does it feel like to be in that space? And, and I think for me, that's, you know, that, um, uh, that relation that you build with space and, um, and, and also the, the fact that I often when I think about um, uh, like the quality of a space, I, I actually often, I'm really relating it somehow to a relationship to the outside. Mm -hmm. So what is the quality of what I'm feeling and sensing in that space in relation to uh, something that's on the outside? So um, I, I, I think the challenge um, and, and I think that, that has come through quite a bit today is, um, is, is really these um, shifting between these scales of um, individual and collective thinking. So how do you um, develop a sense of thinking collectively? Because it doesn't come to us naturally. Um, you know, from an early age, we have a sense that we have I have a different perspective to your perspective, you know, in terms of we're looking at this bottle, you see something different from what I can see. So what is the, the way in which we can sense and develop um, um, a, a kind of, uh, yeah, design that allows for um, multiple ways of seeing something? Mm -hmm. um, of course, this is, it's very complex, right? It's not that... Um, 
um, you know, it will, will be resolved even within the time that you would be in the AA. But I think that uh, we're developing tools here. We're experimenting with ways of thinking, ways of doing something, ways of being. We're developing philosophies um, that we will apply in our practice and in our praxis. So it's an it's ongoing. Um, and sometimes we're going to also do away with things that we once truly held on to and believed that um, uh, that this was the only way to do something. It's recognizing there's multiple ways of being, and then how do we adapt within different conditions of uh, of living? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's about this ability to find your own voice within the architectural education and then mm. be able to collaborate and bring this voice across to mm. work together with other people. Um, but can, can I ask, like, how, um, how can mm, the voice or even a language, how, can, how do you see that? being best fostered. I'm turning the question back on you. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's a very tough question, I think. Um, I really miss this community at the AA, and I think it's something that's really difficult to get back, and we need to get it back as soon as possible, because I think it's all these informal discussions that you have with your friends, with your tutors at the bar, in in the stairwell, and these are just not here at the moment because you know people are just coming for their class and then going home. And I mean, I'm also a culprit of it. It's easy and it's nice. And I really hope this comes back next year because I think it's very important to developing as a person and finding your own voice within the school. Mm. It's, um, if I may <clears throat> insert something, it is also interesting, I mean, I, again, we might ask us to um, revisit history here. Um, I've, I'm very interested in the educational philosophy of um, Joseph Albers in many ways. And one thing that he always de-emphasized uh, in his teaching was the product, you know, that you're kind of like, he always said, we are not making art here. He's, he always said, my my kind of main goal is not, it's it's not the product that my students create products, but it's the student the student is the is the is the is the you know it kind of the medium, and uh, that is actually something interesting. You know that of course the Zoom kind of emphasizes the product that you know that everybody is so glued into those screens. And and what if we try to really uh, kind of de-emphasize the product and try to uh, uh, enhance the you know, like I said, the experiences, the the way we go, you know, that it is really becomes, that becomes our material, you know, that becomes the uh, educational project, uh, uh, you know, de-emphasizing the, the product that we are creating these images and what have you. I don't know. That is one, I think, really important function um, for a, for a school educating these, you know, students, building their confidence, building their, um, you know, sensitizing them to, uh, to their environments, you know, all that, you know, in a way, it's kind of like a little bit like a parental role in that sense, but, uh, or a friend or whatever you call, but it is that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, being the stuff we are working with, you know. Oh, hello. Huh. But then it almost makes me question about how do you actually assess the success of an educational system? Because I think, especially in architecture, it takes quite a while to see if something works or not. And when you say that it's not about the product, but about the person itself, I wonder if the success is comes at the end of the education or if it actually reflects and carries on to the profession of architecture. Because I'm also very much so kind of interested in the relationship between the education and the profession because I feel like especially in architecture there's a love and hate kind of relationship between the profession and the education field. 
So I like I wonder which one is the right one to assess to see if this educational method is good enough or not. Hmm. Maybe, <laughs> sorry. Maybe also for this uh, reason, it's uh, really important to introduce in a more radical way the really the reflection on the impact and also on also on the effects of uh, educational models and also educational uh, teaching experience. Um, and maybe it's something that is um, could be also constitute a kind of platform between teachers and students analyzing the different and several effects of teaching practices and not just, um, for example, leaving teaching practices as too open, but really trying to define together uh, effects of these practices and also try to define the impact of these practices in society because we will confront um, we will be confronting very in a very strong way with the problem of the impact and effects also of course in the ecological emergency and I think it's really important also to maybe find an experimental way to deal with the effects without um, aiming just at the development of a sustainable building. Because for me, it's of course a very important task, but that is what I meant at the beginning. It's a kind of pragmatism. Mm -hmm. um, the, the complex question I think that we are now also um, talking about is find new way, new ways of pragmatics, and that I think for this reason also for John Dewey, mm -hmm. an interesting thinker. But um, so finding new ways also of documenting and reflecting on. Um, effects also maybe of the of the academic institution within the city or within the territories. In this mm -hmm. sense, it's maybe important also to open up a little bit more the academic reality. Mm -hmm. Just um, reflection. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about um, Lucius um, and Anne Marie Burkhart, who taught in Kassel um, in the 1970s in the Department of Architecture and City Planning. And um, Lucius Burkhardt devised um, a, um, what he called like a, a science of walking, Spaziengangwissenschaft, which is like this idea of uh, how the architect or the city planner relates to the city. So this idea of walking as a methodology of a way of thinking through um, walking and design in the city and how things relate to each other. Um, the reason I was thinking about him was because um, the very first day of uh, the students' class, they would have the graduation and the celebration. And then they said, okay, let's get to work. Because um, I think this idea of, you know, of course, uh, working towards uh, some kind of standardized um, excellence, um, it really, I think, maybe uh, has a huge impact on the processes of thinking um, that are very individual, even though they might come out of a collective process. Um, those internal, or that notion of like drawing out is a very individual process as well. So um, in the years that, uh, in the last, I think, two or three years, I've been involved in like, external exams um, for architecture students. Um, at the Royal College of Art and one of the things the moment I know that they're ready or for me in my head like yes they're ready um, sometimes they present a crazy project and you think oh my god like I'm supposed to be the external you know alternative architecture voice <laughs> so I'm, I should not be too like uh, alarmed at something not looking like architecture so um, and I often ask the the question, but you know, this is an incredible project, but what is the role? What do you see your role as the architect within this? And I think what you were sort of mentioning about the voice, mm -hmm. uh, when I hear a very sharp and clear understanding of how they understand, like a personal perspective of how they understand the world through this lens of architecture, I know like, okay, they're ready because they have, it's something about a process that they have gone through themselves. It's not a textbook answer. It's something about a sharpening or a tuning, a sensing that, um, that, that creates the articulation of language 
and, pre and precision in understanding what the role of an architect is. Um, no, totally, I agree. I think there's a lot of self-reflection we go through um, over the years of school about trying to establish what kind of architect we want to be and perhaps even uh, reinvent the role of the architect. And it's something we all go through in all of our projects. Um, and it can be very exhausting and tiring to wrap your heads around sometimes. Um, but yeah, it's always kind of funny to think about also that I kind of question the education of architecture. I mean, this is a bit of a generalization because it's not the same everywhere, but it's on based on your individual journey, which is good for you to build an architect identity for yourself and the point of view, let's say. But at the same time, I think there's kind of a gap between the education and the profession in a sense that you're, mm -hmm. you become very used to working on your own self, let's say, which is completely necessary, but I think the transition between the education and uh, profession is always a bit of a hard one. I mean, I haven't been there yet, but I'm <laughs> guessing that it will be a hard one. Uh, so I was wondering if there was actually a way to, if it's right to say, to make the education similar to the profession or the profession similar to the education itself, or which one is kind of a right model to practice and build architecture. Is it more of an individual journey or more of a collective, mm. uh, let's say? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think outcome. in that regard, isn't the Bauhaus? I mean, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I've said it now. Um, <laughs> the Bauhaus quite an interesting model in that way. When I think about, um, like, for example, I'm not sure what um, uh, architectural, like, if there was an architectural office, let's say, that was based in the AA, how would that maybe um, create this potential transition between uh, the pedagogy of architecture mm -hmm. and the practice of architecture. I know obviously you have practicing architects who are teaching, but um, how could potentially the, the, the work mm -hmm. of an architect or architectural practice or office uh, operating from here maybe transform the pedagogy and how maybe would the pedagogy transform the practice? Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. a question. It's actually interesting to think that, you know, to revisit some of the, you know, like, a, you know, in terms of history lessons, to visit some legendary uh, firms, you know, and see, uh, um, study their culture, uh, their working culture, their collaboration culture. I mean, we just heard from Doshi, uh, who, you know, I, I, maybe Irene has been in the office, but I, you know, can, can imagine that there's a kind of a unique uh, uh, work culture uh, there too. So I think that would be interesting study. I was lucky in my um, early on in my career to work in working offices in Austria and in Finland, where you know we had that culture. It was amazing. It was not the corporate culture. It was a culture of conversation. We had parties. Uh, uh, we traveled together. Uh, we did all sorts of crazy things together, and it was very much a, a sense of uh, unique sense of being part of the community that uh, that stayed with uh, uh, stayed with me. So I think uh, you know. I think you know. In a best case scenario, there is a there is a connection between uh, how an office work and how a good school. That there is a kind of a shared i mean let's face it as human beings i think that's what we want you know we want experiences we want togetherness and that's we want conversations uh and i think a good office a good school fosters our humanity in that sense and what do you think like the role of institu institutional lays oh, i can't say this word i'm sorry Institu institutionalization <laughs> yeah institutionalization <laughs> like what role does it have on this kind of experience and let's say the informality of the experiences that we talk about because in my student years in the AI, i kind of saw the school institutionalized so you kind of feel the changes, wouldn't it? But I just want to know from you guys' point of view and your experiences whether it impacts this or not at all. I don't know. 
Uh, okay, I'll go. Finish yes, of, course there is, of course, there is an uh, impact. Oh, sorry, um, Sepaka. Um, of course, there is an impact if uh, you are the impression that the institution became an institution in a sense of a static um, framework. I think that we also approach uh, this problem in many other institutions. And um, maybe in this regard, education is for me a kind of education, uh, experimental also dimension in which you are trying also to really find new ways also of changing. I don't know if you are changing the profession, but it we could extend also the boundaries of professional practice, introducing new challenges and also new effects, so not, ju not just practices and new forms, but really also new reals in which architecture can play an essential role. I think that this fraction of um, Sepaka was really interesting, also very important to say that there is a lens of architecture. And that is very interesting that the architects have a lens and the architecture is also a lens, of course, of diversity. Because that this means also that through the lens, you are transforming something, you are observing something. You are not just sensing or perceiving as a kind of uh, personal imagination, dealing with forms or representations. I think we have a little bit over maybe overcome this kind of need for producing forms in imagination and new form of reality, but really trying to uh, focus on this idea of lens. That is also the, something that changes the reality and the reality that we have to sense and perceive through, of course, the lens of diversity. But the, I think that the architect or architects is, of course, a generalization, but have a very important power to sense reality and to adapt also different form of mediality to perceive in another way also the world of um, also the realm of profession finding new creative uh, forms and also maybe find a new kind of creative attitudes to deal with the profession and also with the so-called constraints of the profession mm. Um, it's interesting to talk about the lens because when we were also talking about the history of all of these schools, I was thinking about nostalgia and history and mm -hmm. also kind of viewing this history in a very relevant point of view, as you were saying, because relevance is very important. And how important it is or is it important to curate this uh, narrative as an educator or to update it or how do you even update it according to today's times? and today's crisis is on climate, let's say. Mm. Um, I mean, I was, you know, I, <laughs> I had titled um, the talk originally, like, turn around, like, don't look back in anger, which was, <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe too many 80s songs references or 90s songs references, but um, I was um, thinking about uh, when you have a crisis in the kitchen and uh, what do you do? You either, you chuck it away, you know, <laughs> Uh, you start again, you improvise, which is my favorite one because there is a lot of ex you know unexplained things happening <laughs> um, or you you somehow um you know i don't know if you've ever done this when you've cooked something it's disgusting, but you still eat it yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um you know so this is what I mean by i think um did you what you bring with this notions of attitudes? and thinking about uh, what is the institutional culture, uh, what are the attitudes that are being fostered here, what are, the, uh, what are the values. So if you want to institutionalize experimentation or radical thinking or something not just always um, uh, also moving with time and seasonality, it's different from institutionalizing, let's say, an attitude of... Um, of uh, what do you call this word uh, elitism, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. that's you know, or it's different to say I want to foster uh, an attitude of togetherness, of community, of uh, coming together. So I think you know these things I think are very important ingredients to consider in what you're cooking together, what you're making together. Like what are the things that you really value? And um, and I really love what you said about the conversations on the stairwell. You know, the, the, there are these like these spaces mm -hmm. which actually sometimes important little comments or conversation happen, and actually they um, also uh, yeah, play into our thinking yeah. and, and our creating and our making. So uh, for me, I really think it comes back to this question of 
yeah, you know, does yeah, of course, institutionalizing something does have an impact. I think one thing. Um, uh, my 16-year-old niece, I was a little bit like, what's going on? You seem to be a bit too woke for, for me. Uh, but she said, you know, you really need to let go of the past in order to inhabit the future. And I was like, sorry? <laughs> um, I mean, it's also, I mean, I work in a library and an archive, but I do sometimes feel the weight of the, of the, of the institution um, meaning that we're always referring to these great artists that we nurtured and supported in, in the years um, uh, mm. to now. But what about the now and what about the present and how do we talk about talk to the future? How do we um, make space for it? How do we... Um, uh, how can you institutionalize the future? I mean, can you even, right? Or how can you institutionalize imagination? So I think... It's also maybe thinking about things which are maybe not tangible to be able to institutionalize and that allow for constant critical reflection um, and, and coming together in order to kind of work out um, uh, what, what the resolve might be, if, if there is a resolve. Because I also like it when, when, when actually you institutionalize questioning, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, that means there's perpetual questions to, to think together about. Yeah. I mean, I kind of love how you easily ask these questions because most of these terms you use together can never come aside to each other on my mind, like institution and experimentation or stuff like concepts like that for me are belong in such different categories that it always kind of scares me. But I kind of like the lightness of actually being able to say, let's experiment with this and see what this looks like. Mm -hmm. And let's go of the past, like, as I said, the nostalgia of the past a bit. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, this nostalgia, of course. Um, and uh, somebody pointed out in the chat that, of course, all the three schools that I, I uh, referred to in my talk um, were very short-lived experiments. I mean, they didn't last long. And maybe the party should never last too long. <laughs> it wouldn't be a party. <laughs> so... Uh, um, you know, that comes back to this issue of can we institutionalize certain type of culture, even let's say, you know, if the Black Mountain College would exist about how, you know, could they keep the party going? Uh, probably not. Uh, but I think we can still distill. I mean, it's interesting about like, you know, this whole business of kitchens, you know, every culture has kitchens. Uh, there's always been kitchens. There always will be kitchens. That, so there are certain type of basic uh um, you know, even formats or, or traditions, uh, traditions of socializing and teaching that we can, you know, that they never kind of, you know, they, they, they stay the same. There's a certain kind of, like I said, you know, certain <laughs> aspects of being human and, uh, and humanity that don't, you know, they don't change that much across the years. I mean, I think we still want to get together, you know? That doesn't change, you know. We still want to have conversations. We still want to eat good food. <laughs> so I think there is a kind of that's not nostalgic, you know. If I say I want to, you know, I really want to sit together with you and go for a beer. That's not nostalgic. <laughs> that's kind of common sense. So I think uh, I don't know. There's a you know certain things don't need to get reinvented. But I think it's it's more like what can we you know what can we um, you know draw from this history lessons. And it's interesting about Bauhaus because you can look at Bauhaus and like I say, oh, they did really cool stuff. You know, they did cool, cool looking tables and pots. You can take that look at the Bauhaus or you can say it was kind of an amazing uh, moment of time uh, in terms of its, its culture. So, uh, you know, it is uh, kind of two ways of looking at, you know, what was really at stake. Um, maybe we can open the platform to the audience if there's any questions from anyone. Online. Or maybe online. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, one of the things that for me makes the AA so unique is like the diversity of um, the classes and cor uh, courses and the units that you take. And I really appreciate it. Like we 
talked about different ways of teaching and things, and I think that I see that less as the role of like the school and the institution, but through the different units I've been through, I've experienced such quite different approaches to teaching and also about that bridge between education and profession. Different teachers have taught me different ways of going about that. So I think that um, that really happens within the units and I, I hope that one keeps that diversity of units and um, I think that all that kind of like needs to happen are these moments which I've experienced before of like cross unit spaces, which is, uh, for example, when we worked on, um, so the bar is one of them and conversations, but there's also uh, when someone volunteers on helping someone build something, you, you, you work on something and you talk about what you're doing or the time we built uh, for the Christmas party, we set up a structure in here those things or the time in um, community and media, no, what's it called? Communication and media studies, where after the term, you always collaborate with another unit. So I think, uh, yeah, those moments um, are really good. And I just wanted to say that I feel like uh, as long as, um, so this thing about keep the, f the fire burning or the, the party going on, it just, it just depends who's there. And as long as everyone's committed to show up, uh, you get what you get in the time that you're there. And I kind of love that spontaneity that like you don't know what you're gonna get at the AA and each of us gets something different. Um, yeah. Javier, I think has a question. I don't want to derail it again <laughs> this afternoon, but um, I think Denise has actually asked a very, very important question. We cannot forget the relationship between a school and the profession. Mm. I, uh, I never stopped practicing as an architect, and I never stopped teaching since I finished at the AA. And uh, it, one of the most frustrating things as a, as a teacher of practices is to see that in the schools, you're forever trying to break down ties or anything that actually causes in your, uh, in, in your creativity, in your expression. And I'm forever seeing in the profession a kind of determined desire to impose ties and corsets to keep you within a, an institutionalized, a rigid thing. So that, that's my own personal if you want, frustration, right? But I think we are in a situation at the moment where we have to choose a director. And I think that the question that Denise has actually asked is something that I would like to ask the whole panel. How do they see the relation between the school and the profession? I personally think that sometimes some schools pride themselves in producing perfect professionals. And I, it really makes me vomit, sorry, it revolts me very, very intensely, you see. So I'd like to ask the panel, especially you two as well, how do you see this? Okay, thanks. I think it's always uh, important to kind of get experience from people who are professions, and that's why I find the, uh, let's say, the tutor choices in AI quite successful because they're usually people who are active in the professional environment, but they don't necessarily impose that on you. And although like within my questions, I kind of always refer to the importance of getting that profession sense from the school as well. I think it's important to give that little personal uh, space for the person to find their mm -hmm. voice, as we said before. But uh, I think AA should always be in touch with the profession and what's happening around the world because at the end of the day, most of us are aspiring to be architects and we, even if we like it or not, we should be aware on what's happening and what's possible to do with the education we get. So I think it's quite important to keep your ties with the outside world. Not impose them, but always be aware of it and be in contact with it. <coughs> No, I second this. I think it's really beautiful at the AA, the ability to, as we've discussed, have so many different units and everyone's on their own trajectory to find themselves and what kind of architect they want to be. And I don't think this should be lost. Um, I think the, the practice side of things can seem really disconnected some ways, but maybe it's our, our job as students to bridge this gap and bring them together a little bit closer. Um, 
I quite like the disconnection sometimes. I think we're going to work as architects for so many years. It's really nice to have this moment of five or six years to really explore ourselves and where we want to go afterwards and then hopefully get there. Can I ask, is your question in relation to whether the director themselves should have an established practice as an architect? That's, yeah. We've got to choose an architect. Sorry. A director. And we want to know whether, you know, we, what do we want, basically. Yeah? Yeah. Um, because I think, you know, what, what is being said is that this... Um, protecting a space for experimentation, for you also to craft your own voice as architects um, is extremely important here. So being able to create that distinction, I think, is important. Um, but I guess in my mind, I'm questioning how important is it that you have like a fantastic profile as an architect versus a fantastic profile as in creating an education institution that um, really supports this, these distinctive voices that you want to craft here. So uh, what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is like, what I'm asking, what you're asking, I mean, um, is, is, um, is really, you know, are, are we looking here for, for, yeah, this strong architectural voice or are we really looking for a strong director who can lead the institution with, you a, know, vision. with a vision and recognizes and understands yeah, how to create a curriculum that supports distinct and individual voices like that fosters experimentation mm -hmm. that is really at the forefront of thinking you know is not scared to lead the institution in that way so and for me that th those two things it's hard maybe it, maybe it's possible to find both of those things in one person, but I feel as if maybe there's a slight antagonism between the two. Because which architect can we really say um, is able to be that experimental force within the practice and within the field? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is, this is I, my, my yeah. two thoughts. Just yeah. to add something very small, I think it's just to give the relevance of today to that vision but also not having the boundaries of the profession in a way. Because I think the main difference is with the profession and the education is the profession comes with very strict boundaries. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it also brings a vision that is quite realistic and relevant. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what I mean by the soft spot, even with the tutors we're talking about. I think you should be aware, but you shouldn't feel enclosed or encaptured by the boundaries that it brings with it. Yeah. Just a small, mm -hmm. small. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's interesting. I, I, I really think that uh, one should not. Uh, this question about the relationship to profession is it uh, is an interesting one, and I, I don't think we should see the the school as a kind of a prelude to to a profession. I think it's a very unique space. Uh, it's a very unique uh, <laughs> phase in people's life uh, that should be should have its kind of uh, independence. Uh, and just on a personal uh, uh, anecdote, it's interesting because I was a product of a technical university, which was very much uh, uh, conceived as a prelude to profession. Uh, actually, one professor, when I questioned why we have to follow the building codes when we design housing, <laughs> said, our task is to educate professionals to serve the society. And like, get me out of here. So there was, uh, you know, very much the sense that um, we are training professionals. Uh, it was very confining. And it's interesting, actually, because Yale is, um, our school is uh, considered part of the humanities. Mm. Uh, and humanities-based uh, education and I found it very refreshing because suddenly we have voices, you know, like Lydia's voice. We have, you know, we converse with philosophers, art historians, anthropologists, and it's very much encouraged that, you know, the the, the academia is a very special place to uh, foster those interdisciplinary exchanges, for example, and for architects to expand and architects to expand their vision rather than 
narrow their vision uh, at that stage of their life. So I, I really also would warn against the kind of overt professionalization uh, going back to that. Our reviews in Finland, I have to say, we were talking about uh, fire escapes, building codes, <laughs> not <laughs> ideas. Uh, it did prepare for a profession, but it, you know, I would not consider that that is the kind of extreme uh, uh, model where it's all about that. And I think maybe also, if I may, yeah, yeah of I think an important also aspect of this question concerning the relationships between education as profession concerns the way you are defining the field of action of architecture also in education and then after the education. What is the field of action? Because if you are now also approaching the changes of the climate emergency and also of the Anthropocene, then we have um, a wide range of fields of action and we need maybe an architect that is not just um, prepared for the profession, but is also a kind of mediator and initiator for new fields of action. And I think in this sense, the education and an educational um, institution has also the privilege to become, in a sense, a really an initiator for society, for example, for specific city, trying to really show the effects of educational practices within society, really open up university and trying to apply specific effects in specific fields of actions. And I think that that is also the potential power to change the profession yeah. and also to bring um, a new pragmatic into the play because we need all the new pragmatics. If we don't find this kind of pragmatic, then we will uh, build maybe just according pragma pra a new pragmatics of sustainability. And we will maybe not have the power of creativity anymore because we will act according constraints. So we need today a kind of new creativity, but really focus on the experimentation and very specific fields of action, I think. Can I insert one small thing in that, um, that uh, to Lydia's point? I think that's where actually conversation also comes in, because I think the school should also prepare students to be able to converse with different uh, People. I mean, what you said, Lydia, Lydia, requires also that we are able to converse uh, with not only with our members of our profession, uh, but with politicians. And it's also interesting to say that you have to kind of know, uh, use a different language when you converse with different people, different group of, groups of people with different type of experts about the environment. So I think the school should prepare you also, and that's where the parties come in, <laughs> uh, conversations come in, that it's also about communication, ability to communicate uh, ideas uh, within different settings, within different, uh, you know, to different uh, communities, uh, bodies of people. Um, so, uh, hand in hand. I have uh, one, one question. I think this was um, earlier we were discussing about uh, or we were kind of joking about the architect being a director or the director being the architect. So I've been in three different schools. One of them was Doshi's and been through four different directors. And what I've kind of learned about that position is that it really, really dictates the, the kind of professionals that come out of the school. So I was, I was at Doshi School when um, the, the administration board or the main director was um, kind of more inclined towards creating an architecture that does not really, does not really focus on you know, a very hardcore professionalism or building codes. And that's the kind of students that came out of the school. But then it shifted towards a director who is a very, very pragmatic um, architect, let's just say, and who has a huge huge firm based in Ahmedabad and he designs, he's currently designing the parliament of the country, let's just say that. So the, 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 um, the, the position of the director became very key for SEPT University as it transitioned and it really became key in terms of the students that came out of it after the, the transition. So I think this, this kind of 
it, it's actually like really, really important. That question was very important, I felt, in terms of professionalism and in terms of like the architecture, the, the, the profession of architecture. And as, 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 a, as, as you've already mentioned, like I was also at SciArc, which had Hernan Diaz as the director who used to come in a Ferrari every day. <laughs> but the, the, that, that sort of really, really was the, 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 I mean, he was a flamboyant director and that really uh, showed the, the nature of the school and the, the kind of students that came out of the school. And it, it seems like the director's position is, you know, not really a, not really a hierarchical position and we try to be as, um, how do you say, as um, non-hierarchical as possible, but somehow I've always felt like the position of the director really guides the, or the, the director itself really guides the students that come out, like the, the, the philosophy of the school and the students that come out of the school. So I think that, that I think that's a really important question of, of, prof, of the, the profession and the director. So yeah, I just wanted to point that out. But I guess that means then for the selection committee, it's really important then to determine um, what kind of uh, architects does AO wish to foster, because that will, of course, determine which kind of director or directors, because there's also maybe, maybe there needs to be a consideration of a kind of collaborative directorship. Um, if something, yeah, that you want to foster is not necessarily this, uh, because we've talked a lot about kind of social forms, mm -hmm. but um, I'm wondering, you know, is there capacity to think about, you know, uh, and maybe that's too radical, but, you know, is there, is there capacity to think about, you know, a practice being a director as opposed to a single mm -hmm. person? Mm -hmm. And if they also experiment with something that you are not expecting, so it's something that is also kind of results that you are really um, unfold without knowing what is the result of this experiment. And it's really important also that the director is uh, a person that is able to uh, unfold practices and field of practices and not just to propose something from the beginning. Because I think there is a fullness and also richness of this school. And uh, in this sense, it's really important that you find someone that is really able to articulate and unfold this piece and also to bring also voices together and articular, articulate many different experiments that will be um, or will generate or produce the architect of tomorrow. In this sense, I think, or the architecture of tomorrow, in this sense, it's really important to, I think, find a person that is able to um, unfold a, a kind of common dream. I think it's quite important to underline the fact that because personally I was at the AA uh, when there was a director change, so I voted before, but when you're in a younger year you kind of see the role of the director as more of a gatekeeper, let's say. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very important for like the students and the, everyone who's going to vote to understand the fact that this is a complete vision on the world of architecture mm -hmm. and where you want it to go and who you want to be. So I think it's like this was more kind of for the audience rather than the panel. But uh, I think it's quite important to understand the role of the director and how it affects your everyone's uh, education and them personally as well, rather than the community also. But um, yeah, I just wanted to add that as a side yeah. note. No, I think that was a, a really nice way to maybe finish mm. the chat. Mm. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for joining us today and thank you to the crowd. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the day as much as I have. And Denise for, for chairing. That was a um, really good job. Thank you, Sepake, Lydia, and Anna for um, coming, coming today and sharing your thoughts and your experience with us. Um, with this, we close the panel on educating uh, creativity. We're going to now um, have a tea break. So there will be tea in the, in the South Jury Room. For those online, you can also get a cup of tea.
But importantly, we want everyone to join us on the breakout sessions, physically and online. We're going to be going into groups to discuss one or two very important questions. I won't give you any spoilers, but please join us because we want to conclude somehow this event by posing questions and debating what we see as the knowledge game today. Tea, ah, and, there'll be, and there'll be drinks after the conclusion of the event. So please hang around. Um, and I'll see, we'll start at 4.30. Thank, thank you very much. There'll also be pizza. <laughs> thank you very much.